morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Kieran Desmond. I'm the floor manager here for the day. So um, if we could ask everybody to take their seats. Also, we're not oversubscribed for today. So if colleagues down the back would like to move up a little bit further in the day, it might make it easier to hear and to engage with the panelists, because there's a, quite a long haul. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Louise Richardson and the panelists who are going to chair the first session this morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for joining us for day four of the Consultative Forum. Um, we have had a very busy three days and we're about to have a very busy final day, so we're delighted that you're here to join us. Today we're going to start by looking at uh, the global peace and security situation, particularly with perspectives from outside this country. Then we're going to move on to yet another um, emerging threat. Uh, hybrid threats and disinformation. Uh, we look at defense force capability. Uh, we will then have a speech from uh, Eamon Ryan, leader of the Greens and Minister for uh, the Environment, uh, and then two sessions on neutrality in the afternoon. So for those of you who have not been here before, let me briefly outline the choreography, which will be the same as in previous sessions. Um, we will have panelists uh, with a moderator and the use of Slido. There are instructions on how to use Slido up on the screen there. And the reason we're using Slido is to maximize participation. Um, we'd invite you to submit a question, uh, but also if there's a question there that you uh, think is an important one, we'd like you to indicate that you like it. It will then, the more likes a question gets, the more likely it is to be asked. Again, the reason for this is to try and maximize participation. We will also be taking questions from the floor, but many people, if, if today is like previous days, will not get a chance to have their question heard. So, so having Slido is a way to maximize participation. And as in previous days, we would like to stress just how important it is that this uh, forum is conducted in a respectful and inclusive manner. Uh, I would ask you to not to engage in any personal attacks. Anybody should feel free to express their point of view without fear of, of personal criticism. With that, we hope we will engage together on, in an atmosphere of robust civility. Uh, these are issues that people care passionately about. They're very important issues. Um, but we hope that we can model how a society debates important issues in, in how we conduct ourselves today. Um, again, in the spirit of transparency, I would ask when you do ask a question, if you would identify yourself, and also when you submit a question or comment to Slido, I would ask you to identify yourself. If you simply li list yourself as anonymous, you reduce the likelihood that your question will be posed. Um, and again, we've asked moderators as far as possible to try to ensure a, a maximum participation to... Uh, privilege those who haven't previously contributed. Um, and if, in light of all of that, you still haven't had a chance to have your view heard, I would invite you to submit a, an, an online submission to the forum. The consultation will be open until July 7th, and we would invite you all, please, to submit your point of view. This forum is, is intended to be a broad-based consultative forum, so the more participation there is, uh, the better it will be. Um, but I would say we're delighted that about 900 people will have participated in person uh, over the four days. Uh, so with that, uh, let me thank you for joining us and invite the first panel to join me here on the stage. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for joining me. Let me briefly um, introduce our panelists. You have fuller uh, biographies in the, um, in the material you received when you register, so I won't take up time uh, by giving lengthy introductions, but we have Michelle Griffin, who is Executive Officer of the UNGC, uh, and she has asked me to make the point that uh, she is not here representing, she's here in a personal capacity, and not representing uh, the UN Security Council. 
Dr. Sergei Utkin is from the University of Southern Denmark. Um, he's a native of Russia, and I will not be able to resist the opportunity to invite him to talk about events in his native country. Um, Dan Smith is from the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, and Dr. Adam Eberhard is director of the Center for St Strategic Studies in Warsaw. So um, for those of you who have been present uh, every day, uh, you know that this will, to some extent, revisit some of the issues we raised at the very first session in the first day of the forum in Cork. But given the criticality of the geopolitical situation and given that it's precisely the, the changes in that situation that have, has prompted this, the creation of this for, uh, forum, we thought it was important to, again, review the global situation, how it's changing, what the implications of this is particularly uh, for this country. Um, uh, but this morning's session, as you can see, has a, a twist insofar as the perspectives we're inviting from the moderators are from, by and large, outside this country. So um, let me begin by uh, focusing on the issue that has been uppermost in all our minds and, and leading uh, on the TV screens over the weekend. Uh, as we know, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has transformed the geopolitical landscape but this weekend in particular um, caused a great deal of concern about the likely um, unintended consequences from the Russian point of view of, of that action and how that might affect the stability of, of the Russian Federation and how that in turn might impact the broader geopolitical environments. So, Sergei, let me start with you and invite you to comment on, on what's been happening over the past few days in Russia, if you would. Well, of course, not every detail of this event will have uh, global consequences, and uh, we have to keep in mind also that. But um, I'd say uh, um, from the first day of this war, I uh, firmly believe that uh, this is a catastrophe not just for Ukraine, but also for Russia, uh, that um, uh, this creates enormous and unnecessary challenges for the Russian state system. Um, enormous losses that we witness, uh, and this uh, recent case is just uh, another evidence uh, that uh, if you believe that you can uh, be completely in control of uh, a war, which is by definition, like any war, uh, the time of complete unpredictability and uh, things happening that, uh, that, that, that just go um, in the wrong direction completely, um, uh, you, you, that, that, you can, that you can somehow manage this uh, is, is uh, overstatement of your abilities. And um, at this point, you see many, many voices both um, uh, outside of uh, Russia and in the country uh, speculating about the weakening position of the president uh, due to uh, the recent events. Um, I think it's uh, not like uh, uh, we are close to some big political change in Russia. This is uh, uh, not in the cards at this point. But um, uh, this, uh, again, reveals to us a connection uh, that is always present between global security, regional security, and domestic developments. Because very often when people start discussing geopolitics, they just omit the domestic side. They make it look like um, we are um, speaking about uh, billiard balls that uh, go here and there and uh, that nothing happens inside of them, but a lot is happening inside of them. Every society is complex, and in the case of uh, Russia, you witness uh, a system that uh, probably tried to present itself as a billiard ball, try to present itself as completely assembled around the president, but uh, the reality uh, happens to be way more complex, uh, and uh, this complexity strikes back on the, uh, on the initiators of this um, uh, invasion. Uh, but I, I would also say that, you know, uh, uh, people up until uh, this point, um, uh, they uh, somehow... Um, very often talked about uh, new types of wars uh, in, in a way that new wars will be easier and less dangerous than the old wars. 
Uh, this was, uh, this has been uh, discourse uh, uh, since the 1990s. Uh, people expected that you could probably limit your military engagement to uh, peacekeeping operations. Uh, that this will be what uh, advanced nations will have to deal with. Uh, and the war in Ukraine in total uh, shows that uh, this is not the case on the one hand, uh, that you may need a lot of uh, um, uh, stuff, uh, a lot of military equipment uh, that uh, was considered part of uh, the old wars, like from uh, half a century or even a century ago. Um, but at the same time, you have new elements added to that like the private military companies uh, and the effects that they create. Uh, now you have uh, some people even from the Putin's camp uh, saying that probably we went too far playing with the military companies' uh, idea, but uh, um, who decided to do that? Uh, the same people who uh, take a blow because of that. Um, and uh, the private military companies are just one new element that gets added to this old warfare. Uh, you have others, you have drones, uh, who would think about the role the drones are actually playing in this uh, our war uh, and uh, think about the future developments uh, since our panel is supposed to, uh, to address the future challenges. Uh, today you have uh, drones uh, used... Uh, more and more, but still on a limited scale. What if you have uh, a million of cheap drones uh, acting simultaneously, uh, coordinating with each other? Uh, what if you have uh, um, uh, autonomous uh, uh, warfare mechanisms added to that so that they act even without, uh, uh, without a person uh, ordering them to, to, to strike. Uh, uh, these are the challenges that we will most probably face in this century. And the uh, war just showing the combination of old and new uh, that uh, might be a concern for many years to come, whatever uh, will be uh, the uh, decisions of the Russian leadership and the fate of the Russian leadership, because all the governments around the world are watching and taking note. Thank you. Well, Adam Eberhardt, you're a director of the Center for Strategic Studies in Warsaw. You're, um, you share a border with Russia. You've been deeply affected by um, what has happened. What's the perspective from, from Warsaw? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. You know, I, I believe that any autocratic system uh, seems strong until it proves to be very fragile in the fact. And it is the case of Russia. Because, well, in a democratic system, you have a lot of mechanism that allows the steam to get out. In, in, in an autocratic system, people get fr frustrated and they are not able to show what they really believe. And I think it is the case of Russia of today. Russian ruling elite, wider ruling elite, is very much frustrated. They perceived Putin to be a source of stability for 20 plus years. And today they can see that he is a source of their problems. You know, they are deprived of, of financial resources. They cannot send their children to study abroad. They can do not do shopping in, in Western uh, capitals. They are not able to enjoy their great life in the Mediterranean uh, Sea. And, and it is something that gets... A, becomes a bigger and bigger problem for ruling elite. And, and, and as a result of the recent events, I think for all of us and for all of the Russian elite, it became quite obvious that Putin is weak, that Putin was afraid of, the, of Prigozhin, that Putin was not able to respond to the challenge. And uh, as a result, as a result, I think that what has started yesterday, two days ago in Russia, is that an internal front has opened to Putin. It can, it can last for some time. It can, it can be a long, a, long, a long challenge to get rid of Putin. But I think that starting from the last weekend, Putin is seen by the ruling elite as a part of the society of Russia as being much weaker than anyone expected. And I think it is very much important because, well, there are some people who argue, well, Prigozhin is even worse than Putin. Uh, I think that 
what is important if you want the, want the war to, to finish is to get rid. We need a regime change in Russia, and I put it openly, because the problem is that this war is war of Putin. He somehow linked his destiny, his future, with this war, and he will not be willing to accept any compromise. Well, his mentality does not allow him also to accept compromise because he believes that any compromise is just a way to, to cheat an opponent and to get more. And, and, and a willingness to seek compromise is a sign of weakness. So it is, it is his mentality. And, and, and we need an internal change in Russia in order to, to feel the war. And what the Western community should do is to press on it. And a new leader, even if at the first glance he looks even worse, could have a much bigger room for maneuver. Any new leader of Russia would be able to blame Putin for all misdeeds, for all mistakes, for all at atrocities, and to seek new open opening with the West and to withdraw from Ukraine. And it is something we should press. I'm happy that, uh, that Prigozhin, what, whatever we think about him, proved that Russia is much more fragile than anyone expected. Thank you very much. Well, our panel this morning is designed to be on the subject of the, the future of, um, what did we call it, the challenges to global peace considerations for the future. And I think what, what we've seen over the past 18 months is the unpredictability of international um, affairs. Had we been having this uh, forum two years ago, we, uh, I don't think any of us would have been predicting that, uh, that there would be a land war in um, in the European continent. Uh, and indeed, what it also suggests, as, as Sergei has pointed out, that we have in this war both a return to uh, the tanks and trenches reminiscent of a, a, a very earlier form of warfare, along with uh, drones and autonomous, including autonomous underwater um, vehicles, uh, playing a, an, an important role. So the the uh, unpredictable, unpredictability of uh, global affairs is is readily transparent. So here we are, though. The, the, the mandate of this panel is, is to try and predict, or at least to consider, the future of, of international uh, security and what these challenges might be. So let me turn away from the contemporary war uh, that is raging and look at um, international cooperation and turn to you, Michelle, and ask you what you think the major trends shaping the future of international cooperation are. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's an honour. Um, and also, as, a, as an Irish national who spent most of my adult life outside of Ireland, um, I will say I think that the level of public debate here is already very impressive. And I can see, having come home this weekend, how much higher it got as a result of this forum. So, so I know there's been controversy, but I think it's been fantastic. And frankly, I think people in all advanced economies could, could use national debates about multilateralism and what it means in their lives because... Um, I think for too long we've thought of it as something that is mostly about helping people elsewhere. Uh, and, and actually, if anything, the lessons both of this recent weekend and, and, and what our two previous speakers have said, but also of COVID, uh, of climate change, is, is that we are deeply interconnected and that multilateralism and inter international cooperation have meaning in every single person's life and that we're all part of that. Um, so how does that look from New York? Uh, I mean, I think a couple of things. I, you know, the, we really are facing a, a kind of a very deep paradox right now, which is that we're more interconnected than we've ever been in history, but less able to act collectively, um, and, but that the stakes have never been higher. You know, humanity now has the capacity to annihilate itself overnight with nuclear weapons, but also slowly via climate change, and who knows what other capabilities via AI and, and technological developments are arriving at us very fast. Um, you know, recently the doomsday clock got moved closer to midnight and, and, and you know, that occasioned all sorts of hand-wringing. I mean, what that, what that clock tells us is, is not just that the risks are higher, but the system's ability to cope with those risks is lower. And that's kind of what the clock is telling you. And that's certainly the kind of... Uh, vantage point from New York that the, really the only certainty right now is uncertainty and that for sure business as usual is not going to be enough to, to help us solve our shared problems. Um, I think that presents itself in many, many ways. You know, we, we've seen a shift of power, obviously, between states. We no longer are living in the world of 1945, but most of our international institutions were set up in 1945. So we really do need to look at kind of whether they are fit for purpose in terms of 
who's at the table and how much they are heard. And obviously, I think we all know that the Global South feels very underrepresented in many of those institutions. And this is something that the Secretary General has been saying uh, very, very openly. Uh, and it applies to the Security Council and to, to decisions around war and peace, but it also applies you know, across the international architecture. Um, we've also seen a lot of changes within states. Uh, you know, companies, individuals have the power to deliver global public goods, to shape people's life uh, chances and opportunities in a way that, that well, uh, you know, is completely unprecedented. Uh, but again, our global architecture really hasn't taken account of that, of the extent to which, for instance, um, social media companies or big pharmaceutical companies or the fossil fuel industry have at, in their hands the ability to shape people's lives, but they're not uh, part of, they're not accountable for, for those things. Uh, so that's another big kind of, I think, issue that we're grappling with in New York. And then thirdly, between generations. Uh, you know, most of the decisions we make today are made in a very short-term way without taking account of how they will impact future generations. But if we look at climate change alone, we can see that we are really failing to live up to the promises of the UN Charter, which said, you know, opens with the lines that we would save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. I think today if we were to rewrite the Charter, and God forbid, because I don't think we'd get half as good a Charter if we did, but uh, I think the list of scourges from which we need to save succeeding generations would, they, would be that much bigger. So, you know, I think there are big questions around in this age of, of, of deep interconnectedness, kind of a deep erosion of trust and a, and a kind of a set of institutions that just aren't quite fit for the challenges we face. Where is leadership going to come from? Where is responsible leadership going to come from at the global level? And not just leadership, but also resources. And obviously, I've, we've heard some of those, those issues come up here in the forum. Um, I think that the, our interconnectedness has gone from being a source of potential stability. You know, we were bound together, the global economy was bound together, to being perhaps a very big vulnerability. And I know that that has come out in previous days of the forum. Um, and whether that's around the kind of deep levels of inequality in the world and the fact that in this information environment, the rich know how the, uh, sorry, the poor know how the rich live. And, and they, want to, they want the same. Um, and there's a lot of anger out there in the world about the, about the inequality, the increasing inequality, the, ex the fact that 1% of the world's population hoards two-thirds of the wealth. Um, you know, we can't c carry on in a world like that. And the level of mistrust that, that, that that has given rise to is really kind of impeding international cooperation on a whole range of issues, not just peace and security, but, but, but development, human rights, everything. So another huge question that we're grappling with in New York is how do we restore that trust because that trust is, is, is international cooperation is predicated on trust. The, the systems that we have, the voting, the various bodies we have matter, but what matters most of all is that we trust each other. Um, I think I've talked about, you know, that the kind of digitalization, that the life-altering impacts of technology and science have really redefined everything about our lives, everything about the relationships between us and the institutions that govern our lives. And the upsides are obviously considerable, but again, the benefits are hoarded by a few. And the risks and the downsides are really not being managed very well. And we lack the norms and guardrails for that. And we're seeing that again in the peace and security sphere when we're looking uh, not just at Ukraine, but at conflicts all over the world, the extent to which uh, you know, war has really changed and how it is fought, by whom, where, and how the consequences are felt, how broadly they're felt. So these are all uh, issues that we're trying to grapple with from, from the vantage point of New York. The Secretary General will soon issue what he's, what he's calling a new agenda for peace, where he sets out many of these challenges um, as, as part of a kind of an effort to confront member states with their responsibilities in the world today, both the threats we face, the opportunities we have before us, but also how do we kind of um, mitigate the former, harness the latter in a way that, that brings, you know, that the, for the benefit of, of most of humanity and not just a minority. And, and, and uh, the new agenda for peace is one of several kind of big policy um, papers that the Secretary General will put out that try to capture the threats we face uh, in advance of a summit of the future that will take place in September 2024. And the real purpose of that summit, frankly, is not just about the specific changes that we hope it will occasion in the global governance architecture and how we make decisions at the global level, um, but also as a kind of a real signal to people, young people, future generations, people all over the world, that, that international cooperation can and does work. And I mean, it definitely works better than it's given credit for, by the way, lots that still does work. Um, but that it also will continue to adapt to this very fast-paced, changing world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, Dan, uh, think, 
thinking about our responsibility to the world today, one of the critical areas when I know you've thought a great deal about is, is climate and the, the future challenges to our security that would be posed by the climate crisis. Would you like to talk about that? Yeah, I think if we talked about security 40 or 50 years ago, we knew what we were talking about, right? It's got tanks and guns and uniforms and ships and planes and national security. And 30 years ago, or maybe 29 to be more precise, a new concept came along, which was human security. And then this takes into account many of the things that um, Michel was just talking about, um, social inequality, exclusion, deprivation, but also the ways in which, for example, as our societies become much more cyber-sophisticated, we become much more cyber-vulnerable. Um, you know, we, I don't use cash. I don't visit a bank. I don't write checks. I don't do any of the things with money that I used to do when I was in my early adulthood. Everything now is on my iPhone. And I kind of, you know, I, I fear that just hacking into my iPhone allows somebody into the Swedish banking system, just like that. So those vulnerabilities that we have there, are, it's not just to do with social inequality. It's also a vulnerability that comes out of prosperity. So those two areas of security, national security and human security. But I think that now we have to include a third circle, if you like, which is ecological security. And broadly speaking, I think the way to think about this is not as three bits, right? But to think of it like a Venn diagram where the circles overlap. And the most worrying bit is that middle part where all three circles are overlapping, yeah. where you get national insecurity problems driven in part by ecological insecurity issues that are made worse because the society and the government cannot handle them because of the human insecurity problem. So on the ecological side, climate change is a big part of that picture. Um, 2022 was the year of the Ukraine war. Right? It was also the year of devastating climate change impact. You remember the rivers drying up? You remember the hunger stones appearing? You remember Europe having a once in a 500 year drought, China having the worst and most extensive drought ever recorded, and 35% of Pakistan being underwater from the floods. Right? This is a harbinger of what is to come. Every decade has been warmer than the previous decade for the last 40 years. This decade is going to be no exception, and the 2030s will be no exception. And as the natural foundations under our societies shift, so there will be lots of kinds of insecurity which that produces, some of which will produce national insecurity problems if we're not careful. The really, the, the bit where I start to feel guilty as I send out these headlines is the next sentence, right? Because climate change is far from the only ecological issue that we face. So we're, sorry, we're facing the rise of antimicrobial resistance as our commonly used drugs, the antibiotics, start to run out of impact. What happens if our societies shift to a pre-penicillin age? Penicillin and the other antibiotics were miracle drugs, not only because they saved lives, but because people recovered from illness much quicker. What happens if our societies become less healthy? At the same time, the physiological effects of pollution are starting to be felt. Just take air pollution. It doesn't just affect the throat and the lungs. It gets into every organ in the body. The brain is only an organ. It affects the brain as well. There is robust research which shows a clear association, a clear link between intense air pollution and uh, escalated levels of crime particularly violent, unpremeditated crime. There's the whole question of the loss of what's, or the decline in what's often called ecological services, better thought of, I think, as nature's contribution to people. Uh, this is everything from water, water, rainfall, good soil. I mean, good soil has taken millennia to create, and we're, we're wrecking it in, in decades. There's the problem of local tipping points being reached. I don't know if you people will recall seeing back in March, I think, pictures of literally millions of dead fish on the surface of a river. This was in the 
Murray Darling Murrumbidgee River system in Australia, and that was a dead zone which had emerged where there was not enough oxygen in the water. We're seeing these dead zones emerge in seas, in lakes around the world, and they're examples of local tipping points. And the last one is intrusive species. We're always talking about ecological loss or loss of biodiversity and so on, but some organisms are thriving. Uh, sargassum, that brown, smelly seaweed, there is an 8,000 kilometer long belt of sargassum in the Atlantic. The Mexican Navy every day clears unbelievable amounts of this stuff off the beach. And it does it not just because it's ugly, but because in 40, within 48 hours of coming up on the beach, that sargassum starts to rot, it emits hydrogen sulfide, which is extremely bad for the health and potentially lethal. Now, all of these pressures upon our societies are creating weaker, less fragile societies against which we need to mobilize much more of our kind of resilience, innovative capacity, cooperation, absolutely, um, initiative. Here, you know, forums like this are important for trying to see how, how is it that we generate that sense of purpose and energy in, in society and get things into a little bit of proportion. There are many reasons why I resent and loathe Vladimir Putin. Right? One of them is that his war in Ukraine distracts attention from the really serious problems that we're facing over the next 20, 30, 40 years. So the task for the new agenda for peace, for the summit of the future, for all of the working together in whatever ways in which governments, municipalities, provinces, and so on work together, the task is how to make us all, how to give us the basis for a safer and more secure future. And that will be, I believe, in part through getting the, kind of the equation right as far as national security is concerned, that plays its part. As far as human security is concerned, that plays its part, more equal, resilient societies. And as far as ecological security is concerned, getting ourselves into a much more sustainable relationship with nature. Thank you. Well, now, if you're not all thoroughly depressed... Um... <laughs> I tried to finish on an optimistic <laughs> note. I always do. I'm sorry if I didn't succeed yet again. Um, there, there's a very grim uh, view of the future, and we actually haven't touched on many of the other threats of the future. The risks are many risks, like the uh, impacts of the deteriorating relationships between the two largest economies in the world, uh, the U.S. and China, the risk that China might decide to invade Taiwan, um, the near certainty of increased migration uh, from the global south and the impact of that, the, um, the risk of a nuclear accident, uh, uh, or indeed the risk of the election of a, a U.S. president who doesn't believe in, in the history of uh, historical tradition of multilateralism in the U.S. And indeed, I think the declining um, trust in democratic institutions in, in many of the Western countries. So there is a, a raft of global challenges. Um, and so the question for us, in a sense, is what is a small, wealthy, uh, neutral country to do in the face of all these challenges? Um, I think I'm going to start with you, Michelle, just because you, uh, the UN is at least um, working hard at, at figuring out what what can be done? Well, I mean, I think, first of all, Ireland already punches way above its weight at the UN, and, and you know, obviously we hope it will continue to do so. Um, I think some of the issues on which Ireland has kind of sh shown leadership... By the way, we're I'm, I'm personally delighted Ireland's off the Security Council because we missed, we missed you in the General Assembly where, uh, you know, many of these important issues are also um, addressed. Um, and now, in fact, Ireland's playing a, a co-facilitating lead role on the upcoming SDG summit, which is looking at the sustainable development goals and, um, sadly, which are, are massively off track as a result of COVID and climate change and many other things. So, I mean, I would say kind of most of all, Ireland should keep doing what it's doing. But some of the issues on which Ireland has played a leadership role, whether women, and, women peace, and security or nuclear non-proliferation are actually issues that are now very much back to the fore. And I mean, I think I, I see a question coming here about like whether Ireland could play a, the kind of role that it played on the NPT vis-a-vis -vis new kinds of weapons. And certainly I think that is an area where we are, uh, from the Secretary General's office, looking to 
kind of provoke debate. The Secretary General has called already for a ban on lethal autonomous weapons. He's pushing for a, a new kind of body on, on artificial intelligence, new guardrails on many of these new technolo technologies that um, can't be used in compliance with international humanitarian law. So I think there's a huge area there where a country like Ireland could certainly play a big role. Um, I think, you know, continuing to be a country from the global north that is admittedly now very wealthy, um, that prioritizes equality and, and, and sustainable development and, and understanding the kind of uh, the reality of most people's lives in many developing countries. And I mean, I think, you know, as was said, Ukraine has, ta has in some respects, unfortunately, especially in Europe, I think diverted attention and resources from some of these vastly more lasting and existential threats. And I think Ireland could certainly be a very credible voice, uh, is already a very credible voice on those things. I mean, small states are, are, the, are the backbone of multilateralism. Uh, international cooperation is there for small states. The big, the big states don't need it. And, and unfortunately, we're now at a point where, the, where some of the big powers, because they are competing with each other to define new rules of the game, to, to access newly accessible resources, um, you know, they're kind of, they seem less and less inclined, frankly, to respect the charter, to play by the rules that we have. But those rules exist for a reason, and, 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 and they are really important. And I think standing up for the charter, standing up for international humanitarian law, continuing to kind of uh, you know, be the voice in favor of these principles and of the equal kind of, um, for, for leaving no one behind, as, as we say in New York, is, is so important right now. So I think, you know, Ireland has, has a lot that it could do that's, that it's already doing that I'm, you know, as an Irish citizen working at the UN, always very proud to say I'm Irish. Thank you. Sergey, you're based in Denmark, another small wealthy country. What can an individual country do in, in the face of this? Well, first, I think uh, it's uh, not bad to be a small country, definitely. And, uh, you know, on the one hand, yes, your resources are not unlimited, but uh, uh, you also maybe uh, can feel yourself safe from committing the kind of horrible errors that bigger countries can go into and face the consequences. And then, um, you know, just uh, in terms of uh, evolution, when dinosaurs died out, uh, uh, those who survived were very small creatures that uh, gave life to the whole kingdom of mammals, including humanity. Um, uh, so I uh, think um, for a small state, it is, of course, a challenge, uh, as for any other state, how to navigate in this uh, uh, very difficult international environment. But it is not undoable, and the fact that uh, these states, they are normally seen as uh, at least potential providers of uh, a grown level of international cooperation and, uh, uh, and mutual understanding uh, is an asset. Uh, so many of the small states, they have a very positive uh, international image, I think, including Ireland. Um, so it's um, uh, up to you to maintain this image, to develop it, to engage with uh, audiences around the world and to sort of make them know your country better. So the soft power is definitely uh, one of the tools that uh, uh, has to be used. And uh, the other thing, you know, uh, speaking of multilateral organizations, indeed, the, the uh, smaller countries, they find these organizations uh, very important, uh, but uh, uh, then the question is uh, how to make these organizations also efficient and uh, how to uh, make them central to what's actually happening, because if you just have it uh, like somewhere and it doesn't influence any important process, then uh, what's the point of having it? And uh, I uh, think we are passing through a very serious challenge in this regard because uh, uh, for a long time, uh, the point that uh, uh, was made by uh, people from Europe uh, when they uh, traveled to Asia, Latin America, other parts of the world, uh, was that, uh, hey, look at Europe. Uh, we have very developed uh, regional organizations. Uh, you should do too. Uh, just uh, create your own Asian OEC, um, Middle Eastern OEC, and you will be better off. And uh, now, People from these regions, uh, they come to Europe and they say, look, uh, you were all the time teaching us that you have also perfect uh, regional arrangement, uh, so how is it going? 
and indeed it is uh, um, a, very, uh, a very big challenge for the OEC, for all the regional security structures, uh, that they cannot uh, stop the horror that is happening every day with the uh, war in Ukraine. Um, and unless they uh, find a way to do so, uh, people will get more and more disappointed exactly in the structures uh, that are so crucial for small states. So this is a challenge, and uh, uh, to uh, treat um, multilateral organizations as uh, still a mechanism that has uh, a potential that can be used uh, to help resolve crises, even if uh, they fail time and again, but at some point they can help, uh, is an uh, important part of what um, uh, small states might probably uh, assure if they act together and uh, also reach out to uh, bigger ones uh, that are actually very often um, easier to persuade when the initiative comes from a smaller state rather than from their peer. Thank you. Adam, I saw you nodding there. What? Well, you know, well, you ask about small countries. You know, I, I would argue that uh, uh, well, any, any European country is a small one, but some of them do not recognize it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when we recognize, well, there were a number of challenges we were facing mentioned during this panel, and, and some of them are really huge, and they are overlapping, as it, as it was said by Dan. And, and, and in order to cope with the challenges, we certainly have to cooperate within the structures we have. And, 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 and for, for, for our countries, it is certainly European Union. For some of us, it is also NATO and a transatlantic relations. And it is, well, certainly our countries have different perspectives, yes? Ireland is a country which is, well, committed to its neutrality, yes? In Central Europe, where I come from, we well know that there is no such an animal as neutrality. It, 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 won't, it, 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 it will not be recognized by, by anyone, and it is not a recipe for, 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 for peace and stability. So what we truly believe these days, that indeed there are a lot of challenges when it comes to ecology, when it comes to human dimension, when it comes to migration, when it comes to, to, to poverty, when it comes to everything. But my feeling is, is that we have forgotten about the very basic part of security, a military security. It is something which we believed is part of the past, that we are at the end of history, that wars in Europe won't, will, never, will never repeat, and that we do not need to think about the very basic uh, security, which is a military one. And certainly, a military security is related to the other ones. Go, go to Ukraine and see what are, what, we are talking about ecology, yes? Look about consequences of the war, of the ongoing war on, on Central and South Ukraine after, after, uh, after, uh, after a Kachovka dam was destroyed. Uh, so, you know, in Poland, we, we, we truly believe that what we should do is to invest in our military secu security. Our military forces were 100,000. In several years, it will be 300,000. We were one of very few NATO countries that were committed to spending 2% of GDP on defense. Now our defense spending is 3.5%, and our target level of defense spending is 5%. And Poland will be spending 5% of our GDP on defense in five years' time. And, and because we well know, because of our history also, that it is much cheaper to spend uh, money on our own military than to feed our occupants' military. And, 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 and it leads me to one, one more thing, because some countries in Europe might believe that, okay, we are far, far away from a, fr a front line. We are, we, we are safe. We are on the safe side of the... Of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, mm, of a bridge, of a, of, a, of, of a wall. It is not true. If Russia succeeded, if Putin succeeded in Ukraine, he would probably try to destroy European institutions as such. By invading Lithuania, Latvia, or Estonia, Russia is able not only to achieve their goals there, not only to achieve their goals in Latvia or Estonia, he is able to destroy the whole our community because all these three countries are 
not only members of European Union, not only members of NATO, but they are also part of Eurozone, they are part of Schengen area, they are part of a lot of structures we share and we, we should cherish. And, and because of that, I believe we all are small nations in Europe and we have to cooperate and we, we have to think about uh, the challenges, the security challenges, also including military uh, security challenges uh, together in order to become stronger. Thank you very much. I'm going to um, invite Dan to make a few comments on this point and then I'm going to turn to Slido in the audience. Dan. Yeah, two, two things I'd like to comment on. One is, I'm, I'm not sure, Adam, who you mean by we, as the forgetting about the military. I've been director of CIPRI, the Stockholm Institute, for eight years. And every year I write the introduction to the yearbook in which I have found myself each year tracing a decline in all security indicators and an increase in military spending. Yeah. Uh, military spending hit $2 trillion a year, which is the highest level it has ever been before the uh, invasion of Ukraine. That's the figure for 2021. It's now at about $2.2 trillion US dollars per year. Um, at the end of the Cold War in 1990, it was about $1.5 trillion. <coughs> a period of decline and then a period of increase. Um, obviously, some of that increase has been China's. Some of it has been uh, yes. Russia's, to a modest degree. A lot of it has been Europe's, and a considerable amount has been the, been the US's, and some in the Middle East. But I think that it, it isn't the case that we, we, as a world, had turned away from thinking about the military instrument. It's just a particular case that, yes, this war... I think was imperfectly, the risks were imperfectly understood, radically badly understood uh, before the war happened. That I would go along with. The other thing which I wanted to say is when you come to the, what the role of Ireland in all of this could be, I think there are two balances which we are seeking in world affairs. And one is between the great powers. And that especially means, although it looks like it means getting it right between the West and Russia, and that is certainly a serious European problem. And there's a question has come up about um, how does Europe and Russia live alongside each other, which I think is really, really troubling. But the key balance there is obviously between the USA and China, because China is the rising power while the Russia is the declining one. The other balance that we need is for sake of simplification between North and South. Right? The, the rich world promised $100 billion dollars in climate adaptation support well over a decade ago and hasn't provided. Right? Part of the balance is the rich North needs to start making serious commitments to be supporting the, the, the global South in these different policy aims which we in the rich North support and needs to stand by the promises which are made. You don't want to follow through with the commitment. Don't make the promise in the first place. It just really poisons the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And I think that the role for uh, Ireland, and this is the kind of the privilege of being a small country that you were talking about, Sergei, is it doesn't have such a share in the guilt. It is easier for Ireland to get itself into a position in some of this, along with others, not exclusively, of a kind of honest broker towards that north-south balance. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take a bunch of questions from Slido. I'm going to group them by subjects. So there are four roughly on the Russia war in Ukraine. So I'm going to take those and then I uh, turn to the panel and then I go to the floor. So Sean Darcy asks, how do you see Russian society and government evolving over the next 10 or 15 years? And how does the West try to live side by side with Russia into the future? Um, Rose Fleming says, East, this is more a statement than a question. Eastern Europe were raising the alarm on Russian aspirations for their countries and states outside NATO for years. After Georgia, Crimea, how can it honestly be said war was not predictable? The West was appeasing a dictator. Um, Scott Fitzsimmons asks, what lessons can be drawn from Russia's heavy reliance on Wagner at PMC to provide defense and security? And Dermot Hayes says, the idea that nobody predicted war in Europe is a myth should we listen more to anti-war activists who are raising the alarm about militarization in Europe? So there's a bunch of questions about Russia, uh, Russia and Ukraine. Who'd like to start? 
Sergey. Well, uh, I will probably start, but I'm sure other panelists also have uh, thoughts on that. Um, of course, it's, uh, it's uh, impossible to know the future, but I think uh, quite some people engaged in what is called um, scenario exercises, uh, sort of developing the spectrum of scenarios that uh, are plausible. And indeed, uh, it, it is uh, not like you didn't have uh, catastrophic scenarios uh, uh, in this spectrum or um, scenarios that are definitely bad for everybody, but very often you come up with this spectrum of scenarios and then people say, okay, uh, this is definitely bad. Uh, we just uh, try make, to make sure that this will not happen. And this is on the expert level, among people who want to avoid conflict, uh, who uh, want to support peace. Is it always the case uh, at the level of politicians? Not really. Uh, they often try to make use of uh, conflictual dynamics. Uh, they uh, try to instrumentalize it for their own purposes. And you get what you get. It's not, it's not like they, they, they didn't know that, uh, I mean, I say the Russian politicians didn't know that uh, the uh, war would um, uh, come along with uh, uh, unprecedented Western sanctions and unprecedented level of uh, pressure on the country. But the decision was taken, nevertheless. Um, and uh, that means that uh, also in other cases, when you were either on the brink of uh, a bigger conflict or cross this uh, threshold, uh, it's uh, not that easy to go counterfactual and say what would have happened if you did something differently. Uh, this goes for uh, Georgia, for Crimea. I perfectly know these arguments that uh, if uh, the West uh, acted in a more severe manner, probably things uh, would have been different. Uh, but uh, um, you cannot, cannot check this. It's, it's, uh, it's counterfactual history. Um, but uh, definitely, if, uh, if uh, um, uh, we look at the situation these days, uh, these, uh, these voices uh, that were speaking in favor of uh, uh, more severe sanctions, uh, they had the upper hand. Uh, you still have uh, many countries uh, out there in the what we call global south uh, that are completely not sure that they should uh, join the Western approach uh, in terms of sanctioning Russia but the West holds together. So in the West, it's basically now the mainstream approach uh, that uh, severe sanctions are needed to basically uh, well, send the message and uh, limit the abilities of the Russian state in the war. Um, and still, uh, the uh, Russian policies uh, don't change just because of that, even if uh, life of people in Russia gets uh, worse uh, because of the sanctions. Uh, the, 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 the propaganda messages they get by uh, state media, they still persuade them that the government is doing the right thing, and a lot of people believe, which is probably uh, a, a, a hint into uh, the next panel dealing with the hybrid threats and, uh, and uh, all sorts of uh, disinformation challenges. Um, so the, this, uh, you know, the, there's uh, quite quite uh, quite um, a difficult uh, difficult uh, uh, situation that uh, we have to face here and uh, in terms of uh, future developments in Russia uh, you know I, I'd say um, the time horizon matters I, I, I uh, still hope a political change uh, on a large scale uh, and a political change to the better is uh, possible in Russia at some point but if, uh, as uh, uh, the question and slider suggests, we focus on the next uh, 10, 15 years, I'm afraid uh, we um, are already finding ourselves in uh, the situation of uh, what's de facto Cold War, or even worse, because uh, um, this is not just the Cold War on broader scale, but it's a hot war in the center of Europe. Uh, and imagine uh, the uh, war uh, continues as a sort of um, stalemate with uh, Russia controlling parts of Ukrainian territory. Uh, others are not uh, willing, able, ready uh, to recognize this even as uh, de facto state of affairs, trying to counteract. 
and this is how you live from one year to the other. Um, this will mean that uh, uh, Russia will be seen as uh, the major threat by the Western community, and the West will be seen as uh, the major adversary, which is uh, already um, uh, sort of uh, the case with uh, the latest uh, edition of the Russian foreign policy concept, um, um, and how to find channels of communication and, uh, and measures to avoid uh, uh, worse uh, uh, things happening, uh, to maintain some confidence-building measures, uh, that's, that's quite a challenge. Uh, in the Cold War, people managed to do that, but in the Cold War, uh, they at least recognized each other as legitimate actors. And currently, you may face the environment where um, a lot of nations in the region will be saying, uh, we don't think this is Russia, and Russia will be saying, uh, we tell you that this is Russia, and that's it. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 and uh, how, how can you find some middle ground with that? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a huge challenge, um, and I uh, uh, would be very arrogant if I said that uh, I have a, a clue to this. Thank you. Um, I'm going to let Adam come in, and then I'm going to go to the audience. Adam. Okay, well, well f first let me come back to the question of, of, of defense spending. I, I believe that the proper level of defense spending is a level that allows us to deter an aggressor, a possible aggressor. And, and it, is, it, 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 is, it is the most important. And certainly we should acknowledge that deterrence has two pillars. One is a military strength, so our military power. But the second one, which is even more important, or which is equally important, it is a psychological strength. So if we keep saying that we are not able, not willing to use our weapons, we are not willing to engage in war, we are not able, so we, 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 won't, we won't deter. In order to deter, our message should be strong and clear, and a possible aggressor should know that we are ready to respond and we are not afraid of it. It is one point. The second one is that there is no more deterrence by punishment. It is not about our message that we will be able to reclaim territories, to liberate them. For people of Bucha, for people of Irpen, for people of different towns of Ukraine, being liberated was too late. What we should do is to be as strong as that we may deter an aggressor and this deterrence will be by denial. So we will not allow him to occupy our territories. The question about Russia, fate of Russia. You know, I think well, Russia will eventually lose the war in Ukraine, and it is already quite obvious. It is also quite obvious for people like Prigozhin. And as a result of the war, it will speed up the process of the imperialization of, of, of Russia. It is a painful process. It is a very painful process for Russian elite, but it is also an extremely painful process for Russian society, I'm afraid. Uh, it will lead also to some kind of a demodernization of Russia. It, well, uh, sanctions are not working at once. They are, they, they are a long-time uh, uh, instrument of, 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 of pressure. And as a result of the war, I believe Russia will become more and more dependent on China. We should not forget that there is a huge disbalance of power. Russian GDP is just 10%, 10 of Chinese GDP. As a result of the ongoing war, a level of Russian dependence on China will only grow. And, 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 but, but what is the most important for us? We want, we want Russia to be part of Europe. European family, but first Russia has to undergo, undergo the process of the, imper, the, the imperialization and to acknowledge that, uh, that, 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 that uh, um, attempts to uh, change the European security order by means of force is a road to, to nowhere. Thank you. I'm going to go to the audience now and take about three questions. Um, Yes, I see this one gentleman here, but I'm not seeing, there's an, I see another hand way in the back and one here. So yes, please. 
Yes, yeah, sorry, this gentleman here first, and then the back, and then on the left. Uh, my, my name is Sean Quinn. Now, I'll tell you my question, and I'll just make a few comments on my question, and I feel that you, you have maybe half answered the question uh, that I'm putting. And my question is, is the threat of Russia greatly exaggerated? And I'd nearly underline uh, greatly three times. Now, the reason we're here today is because of the behaviour of Russia. And we're going to make decisions are being made and are going to be made because of Russia. But, like, the population of Russia, I think, is around 141 million. About 110 of those are in European Russia, and they're not all ethnic Russians. And if you look at wars that Russia has been involved in, ignoring the Second World War, against Japan in 1905, the Winter War against Finland, and the current war against Ukraine, well, they haven't done very well. And Russia, historically, is a very... Uh, autocratic country, it's currently very corrupt and it's, it's very uh, inefficient and it wastes resources. Uh, they talk about the Russian bear. I would say it's a toothless bear. It's certainly distracting attention from far more serious issues. Uh, because of this threat of Russia, the people who are benefiting and the people who benefit it from the invasion of Afghanistan or the invasion of Iraq or the military industrial complex. Now, most of the, que the reason we're here is because of the behavior of Russia. Most of the questions are touching upon Russia. And we're going to make decisions because of the behavior of Russia. So, I mean, is the threat of Russia greatly exaggerated? Thank you. The gentleman in the back. Hi, um, my name is Eamon Rafter. I'm to, here today representing World Beyond War and the STOP Alliance, which is an Irish alliance against the growing arms trade in this country. Um, I wanted to, to refer to, to Dan Smith's uh, uh, input and, and, and again to thank him for his, his reference to human and environmental security because I think this conference has generally been dominated by, by a conversation about state security. Uh, and I think we need to get back to talking about people and, 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 and the impact on the environment. However, I, I have a question to pose, and this can, this can be to anyone in the panel. I, I still wonder why we, we, we are preoccupied with referencing militarism as a solution rather than a contributor to, to, the, to the issues that we face. Therefore, I would w want to highlight militarism as it's itself one of the major challenges we're, we're facing. Uh, so uh, why don't we talk about climate change uh, as a contributor to insecurity rather than talking about uh, um, you know, insecurity as a consequence of climate change? Because if we look at it and if we're honest about it, militarism is one of the most significant drivers of climate change that we're facing. Um, uh, U.S. military emissions, for example, uh, um, uh, uh, and their consumption of fossil fuels are one of the, the biggest, uh, 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 if you like, dri drivers of that. So why are we not talking about militarism? militarism? Why, to me, it's the elephant in the room which this conference at some level fails to, to, to challenge because militarism is one of the problems we're facing rather than one of the solutions to the crisis, in my opinion. Thank you. And then the gentleman in the brown jacket in the fourth row. Hello. Um, David Egan is my name. I'm a citizen, not a member of any organization or political party. Um, I want to first of all say just to commend the organizers for creating such a platform that I as Joe Citizen can be here to be involved and learn and uh, listen to the information. Um, my motivation to be here today is I am fascinated and believe there's a huge potential of Irish neutrality now in the future in the state of the world. Uh, 
my main question actually is to Michelle. Um, I know she's not representing the UN, but I am very interested in the potential of Irish neutrality uh, as a previous, as a country that's a previous colony in Europe, uh, with the non-aligned world that's developing at the moment is going to be crucial over the next two decades. Latin America, Southeast Asia, and uh, Africa. Uh, and I just put in the footnote that e EU and ASEAN are the only two areas in the world that are trying to uh, work together in a way that's dealing with the global and some of the issues that uh, Adam was mentioning. Thank you. Thank you. Panel, who'd like to respond? Dan, I think a couple of those were addressed to you. Um, yes, well, I'll take the second question first. Um, militarism, to me, is an ideology which overrates the importance of the military in national identity as a solution to problems and so on. So I don't feel that a... Uh, approval of a defense policy or supporting policy positions over defense, even the deployment of weapons, the spending of money, I don't think that's necessarily militarism. And I think one needs to uh, div divide the things apart. Militarism is certainly a, a problem. Right? Militarism is a problem in, in Russia. You do indeed see it rear its head in, in the West, where there can be a, a jump towards a military solution to what is a uh, essentially a political problem that could be resolved by diplomatic and uh, development aid and so on, other kinds of means. And militarism is also a, a problem, though it seemed for a while as if it was diminishing, in the global south. But we've had what the Secretary, UN Secretary General was referring to as an epidemic of military coups uh, in, the, in the last few years, which has, has brought it back. So I just, the first thing is I just want to get that term Un under control. Not everything where you talk about the military is it fair or accurate to talk about militarism. Um, but certainly do not take the military, even the non-militaristic military, as a solution to all problems. You cannot attack climate change except metaphorically. You, ca you can't put up a defensive wall against climate change except metaphorically. So don't put um, a military uniform on all of the solutions. And to talk about a link between climate change and insecurity or between other ecological problems and insecurity is not to say that the security sector has the responsibility to, to solve them. But the questioner also raised the, the issue of the military sector contributing to the problem of global warming through its vast consumption of uh, fossil fuels and so on. Now, the, the US military taken as a whole, if it were a country, would rank about number somewhere in the um, high 30s, just short of number 40, in the league table of um, greenhouse gas emissions. Right? So, I mean, given that the US military is just one part of the government sector of one country, that is a, a huge contribution. But again, let's not overestimate it. And it is to a modest degree balanced by probably more than you know the Pentagon is one of the biggest green investors in the world. And if you listen sometimes to the speeches of Secretary, uh, NATO Secretary General Jan Stoltenberg, you find a surprising degree, perhaps, it would surprise you, of encouragement towards um, self-sustaining green energy. Why? Right? Because with that, you can, sh you can uh, have less vulnerable supply lines for military operations. Right? There are sound military, tactical, and strategic reasons why the military wants to go green. So I'm not romanticizing the, um, the green investment that the Pentagon is, uh, is making. Um, that said, it's clearly true that um, were military spending to come down, that would be one way to release resources uh, for, um, for helping the green transition. Can I just comment quickly on the question of is the threat of Russia greatly exaggerated? Depends to whom the threat is yeah. that you're thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. I think what, when Adam is talking about Russia's neighborhood and the Baltic states, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to express a view about my adopted country, Sweden, and its 
sudden decision taken last year to apply for NATO membership, but I really do understand it. In that neighborhood, I certainly understand it. One should not underestimate, by the way, in that picture, that there's also Nordic solidarity is a real thing. So when Finland decided with its, what, 1,200-kilometer border with Russia, that given Putin's behavior, Finland clearly decided, and quickly, we feel safer in NATO, then it was pretty predictable immediately, the tone of debate. I was there at the time. The tone of discussion shifted like that in Sweden, and partly because of the threat, but partly also because of Nordic solidarity. But is the threat of Russia to Ireland? That, that's different from the threat of Russia in the, in the immediate geographical vicinity. So it depends how you define the question. Yeah. And the last comment on this, just to link back to my earlier remarks, is I very much agree with John Kerry, the former Secretary of State uh, of the USA, who's now the, um, Biden's climate envoy, who remarked quite recently, he said, um, what do you, th no, this is the way he put it, he said, I agree with my president that the risk of nuclear war is greater now than it has been for 60 years. I would put that risk as somewhere in the single digits in percentage terms, less than 10%. Not sure where, but less than 10%. What is the risk of total disaster and catastrophe if we continue on the same road yeah. as far as global warming is concerned? The answer, my friends, is 100%. Yeah. So I just want to put different threats into context in relation to each other. Michelle, one of the questions was directed to you. Right, and I'll get to that in one second, but I just want to jump on, on Dan's points because I think they're so important. Um, I mean, I think this idea, and I think it really is worth thinking about when we, you know, we're so lucky in Ireland geographically, as has been kind of, and, and, and in terms of prosperity, mentioned many times. And, and I do think it's really important to think about how, what the world looks like for other people who are facing other kinds of threats. Uh, and, you know, if you're a Latin American woman facing just uh, insane levels of gender-based violence, or if you're a citizen of a Pacific island whose entire country is about to disappear underwater, or if you're a Kenyan farmer for whom drought and food insecurity are, are you know, you can't think about anything else. So I do think it's, it's important to understand that some of these debates around Ukraine particularly are, are, you know, more acute here in Europe for very obvious reasons, but for millions and billions of people around the world, the threats are different. And I think it's really important to always bear that in mind. Um, Violent deaths from, from, from gender-based violence and organized crime massively dwarf conflict-related deaths. Um, during the first year of COVID, when all we could talk about was COVID, uh, air and water pollution alone killed 9 million people, far more than COVID. So I just think it is really important to kind of have a sense of what the actual threats are to the, mo the vast majority of people. And I think, it, you know, fast forward 10 years, 20 years, absolutely climate change is going to be, you know, the foremost threat for most people in the world, and it already is for billions of people, and it's just so important to kind of keep those proportions in mind. In terms of the question uh, to me, Irish neutrality uh, in, in kind of UN terms and as a previous colony, what, what, how does that kind of... Um, help us not be non-aligned. I mean, look, I don't want to wade into those very controversial debates too much, but let me just, on a personal basis, my impressions again from, from decades spent at the UN, um, is that it's not the first thing most people think of when they think of Ireland. I mean, you know, Ireland's identity as, as a player at the UN and in global governance is definitely shaped by our history of experience with famine, of experience with conflict and, and mediation, um, of our leadership role, as, as I mentioned, on, on um, nuclear non-proliferation. And of course, I suppose neutrality is in there somewhere, as I think it came out on a previous day. But I don't think it's the first thing other countries think of when they think of Ireland. Um, and, and let's also not overstate what it means in terms of where we sit in the global kind of negotiating uh, landscape. We're still a member of the Western European and other group in, in kind of a general assembly negotiation terms. We are, we're, we're a member of the European Union. You know, we're a very rich country now, weirdly. Um, and so, you know, I just think it's kind of when, when people see Ireland, they do have very warm, I think, feelings about us, and we're very lucky in that respect. But I also think that, you know, the neutrality is not the first thing I think most countries think of when they think of, do I want to work with Ireland in a cross-regional coalition on something important in the General mm -hmm. Assembly? Or do I want to be a co- sponsor with Ireland and the Security Council of a resolution on, on climate and security. Um, you know, it's the whole package of, of who we are as a country and, our, and the leadership we've shown. Thanks. 
I think what I'd like to do, if you don't mind, is um, because we're, we've only got about 10 minutes left, take another uh, uh, group of questions from Slido and then give each of the panel mm -hmm. a chance to respond. Is that all right? I, don't, I know you're... Okay. Did you... I, I just wanted to respond to two questions okay. briefly. briefly. Okay, just right. on militarism. Well, I fear that we are not able to overcome risks posed by militarism of the enemies of free world with flowers. It sounds beautiful, but it is not the case. When it comes to whether Russia is strong or weak, well, the people of uh, Bakhmut or Mariupol would probably not agree with you when you state that Rus Russian threat is over overestimated, but, but indeed, Russia is weak, and I think that also Putin acknowledges that, that he is aware of the weakness of Russia, that the window of opportunity has been closing, and there is an inefficiency of the model of the Russian development, there is a, 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 a growing technological dependence on, 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 the, on, the, on the world, but yet Putin believed that he is stronger than the opponents, that the there is a decline of U.S. leadership in the world and that there is a demise of European project and that he, he could use the opportunity. He probably failed, but he believed that there is a window of opportunity for him given weakness of Russia. Thank you. Um, well, in his response just now, uh, Dan, I think, addressed the question posed by Ono Lera. So let me go to Dermot Hayes. Should Ireland be more active in campaigning at UN level for non-proliferation of drones and autonomous weapons like Frank Aiken did with nukes? Uh, Senator Catherine Ordaz, can you expand for Michelle, can you expand on the role of AI in future defense considerations? Edward Hogan inquires why the forum has ignored the breaches of the UN Charter and international laws by, by the US and NATO in Iraq, and else, in, in Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, and elsewhere. And finally, April Lawrence asks, population growth and global overpopulation is a factor that is never discussed. What effect will, will it have on security in the future? So I'm going to invite each member of the panel to, to respond to any of those they'd like, and um, we're going to cover them all in 10 minutes. I'll start with you, Dan. Aye, aye, aye. <laughs> so... Um, I'll leave aside the question of Ireland and um, drones. Some, somebody else can take that. Um, a quick comment then on the population question. Because, um, yes, of course, demography is going to be um, important. But it's a little bit, it depends, what do you mean by the word future? I'm sorry to keep on coming up with what do you mean by the word this, you know, threat, militarism, future. But sometimes a little bit of precision in understanding what the question is can, can help. Because the, the trend for population growth is that it starts to tail off. Now, this will be regionally diverse, um, so Africa will continue to have a population increase, it's expected. Um, but elsewhere, it will, be, it will be tailing off. And I fear that the issue then is not going to be population growth in the way that it's normally thought of and, and numbers. It's going to be the aging of the population. Right. Now, if you combine the idea of a, an aging population with my, the first of my, two of my nightmare visions about a less healthy population which can't turn so easily to antibiotic drugs, and you relate that to economic output and so on, you just keep on sort of connecting one thing to the next, it doesn't paint a rosy picture of, of, of the future. But it's certainly a future that we can be planning for. And it's certainly a future that we would expect that the upside of the new technologies, cyber, artificial intelligence, um, or, or, or machine thinking, um, should be able to, to, to help us uh, with. The other thing I'll say, just as a con concluding comment, just to tie the different uh, bits of what we've been talking, or what I've been talking about together. Um, the, the question, and I sort of alluded to it, about um, reducing military spending for, um, in order to help with the green transition, I think that would be a great idea. I think that at the moment and for the next five to ten years, that is not a, 
um, a proposition which is going to fly in practical politics. I'm really sorry about that. I wish it were different, but I still want to, there to be resources available for the green transition. So rather than raiding the military budget, I suggest that we do two things. One is we stop directly subsidizing fossil fuel industry. That will, according to the IMF, retrieve about $500 billion a year. And the second thing is that we should cut down the indirect subsidies to the fossil fuel industry, which, according to the IMF, costs between four and, five, four and six trillion dollars a year. So there are ways in which the resources are available for the green transition. Right? We should not regard ourselves as being trapped, not even trapped by the war in Ukraine or by Vladimir Putin. Right? Political decisions can be taken to push these processes forward, to push the green transition forward, build social resilience, arrive at a more peaceful and secure future. Um, so I don't know what role all of these policy documents from the Secretary General are going to play and the Summit for the Future, but that is the right direction in which to be thinking and trying to press, and political leadership needs to step up in order to achieve those great goals. Thank you. Uh, sorry we are so pressed for time, so I'm going to invite you please to be succinct in your responses. Sergey. I'll try, but I will still get back to this question of Russian threat and militarization uh, together. Uh, I think uh, there is a risk in going radical on anything. So if you just concentrate on uh, military as your only tool and your only preoccupation, you're in trouble. If you completely forget about it, you're in trouble too. Uh, if you only think about Russia the whole day and you uh, forget about all other important issues that were also named at this panel, uh, you uh, are in serious trouble. Um, if you just ignore what's happening in Ukraine and you say it's uh, all about uh, um, global uh, cooperation and peace and we can just talk to each other and resolve all issues, uh, you're ignoring the realities. So this is... Uh, um, uh, what uh, we have to keep in mind. Um, on uh, the um, uh, non-proliferation of drones and autonomous weapons, uh, of course, it's up to Ireland to decide uh, what uh, uh, the country will do in this uh, respect, but I think uh, there is, uh, of course, uh, uh, a very big temptation to um, limit the spread of these technologies, but the our problem is that uh, these are not uh, nuclear weapons when you can uh, rely on uh, a limited spread of uh, the basic materials used, basic technologies used. Uh, we will most probably live in the world where more and more countries will have access to technologies like these, uh, definitely to drones. And then the question is, uh, uh, imagine in the most advanced countries you have a decision taken uh, that these drones should not get autonomous and they shouldn't turn into uh, robot killers. But in some other countries, less advanced, these can also be produced and they don't have this hesitation on the moral grounds. And what happens then? Uh, so this is, uh, this is a question that doesn't have an easy, an easy solution. And the uh, last point on um, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq and uh, other cases, you know, uh, of course, uh, in, uh, in, in the Russian diplomatic discourse, this is a constant point, uh, like the, 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 the West is blind on uh, its own mistakes, and uh, it is only pointing at um, uh, what we do. But uh, you know, the uh, thing is that um, uh, I don't think it's unresearched topic, so you have uh, a lot uh, written and said about that. I think uh, it is uh, pretty much the mainstream by now in the U.S. to admit that uh, Iraq invasion was uh, uh, quite uh, a mistake, to put it mildly. Uh, but uh, the question is rather, if we speak not about history but present and future, uh, how you um, pay for the mistakes and uh, in which way uh, you admit the responsibilities. And in this sense, you know, uh, there has been quite uh, a lot of uh, ado around the International Criminal Court and its uh, a decision to, uh, to, to, to uh, issue an arrest warrant against uh, President Putin. 
uh, but uh, we know that uh, the United States uh, went uh, far over the board to make sure that no U.S. citizen is ever, uh, is ever uh, sentenced by the International Criminal Court or even uh, comes uh, in front of the court uh, under any uh, circumstances. And then the question is, if we indeed believe in multilateralism and the uh, bodies of international justice, uh, can the West maybe set a better example in terms of how to treat these institutions and to uh, also be ready to, uh, to see their citizens uh, in front of those international institutions and not to believe that these are just for, uh, for, for, for uh, poor countries uh, that don't have uh, um, guaranteed justice at the national level. Thank you. Michelle. Uh, well, thanks. I can be quick. Um, I mean, just to flag, I suppose, and, and hopefully respond to a couple of the questions in, in one go, all of the issues around demography and kind of people's expectations of, of, of life, you know, come, bumping up against planetary limits, um, plus many of the issues around new weapons and, and weapon technologies and how we introduce oversight and human control over their malicious use, uh, they're all part of this package of, of issues that the Secretary General is kind of pushing for uh, debate and decision at the summit of the future in September 2024. So my answer to the question about Ireland's role is, you know, very much hope to see Ireland kind of championing lots of those ideas, but also then the kind of bigger picture um, objective, which is really reinvigorating multilateralism so that it is, it is fit for coping with not just the kind of more longstanding uh, unresolved issues and broken promises that Dan has mentioned, but also these new threats um, and opportunities that are coming at us so fast. Thanks. Thank you, and thank you for being so succinct. Adam. Well, Jeff, a question about demography and, 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 and population, migration, things like that. You know, it needs an additional session to, 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 to discuss it, but, but I, would, I, would, I would argue that there is a linkage between poverty and demography, and what we should do, especially in Africa, is to rethink our development aid, is to provide the people the with rod rather, rather than with the fish. And what we should start at the very beginning is just to reduce tariffs for the goods that are produced in Africa. So we allow them to develop so there is, uh, so there is a better conditions uh, over there. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. So believe it or not, we've finished on time. Thank, mm -hmm. Please join me in thanking our panelists for a really stimulating discussion. <laughs>
we're about to start the next session. So if I could ask people who uh, are standing, if they could please resume their seats and maybe move up to the front as well. Um, so I'm going to hand over to our moderator, Sinead, here, who's going to take this session. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Sinead O'Carroll, editor of The Journal. The Journal's Fact Check Unit is the only IFCN accredited outlet in Ireland. So myself in work, we've been dealing with some of the disinformation we see at a news level. Um, but today we're going to get insights into the origins, the wider issues of foreign influence, and hopefully the solutions of some of the disinformation and the influence um, of that disinformation. First, some housekeeping some housekeeping, you'll have heard some of this earlier, but just a reminder of the guiding principles of the forum, most important of which is to refrain from any personal attacks on anyone here or not here when it's your time to speak, and we'll have lots of uh, questions from the floor and comments from the floor, hopefully. Just keep your time, our time and our topic in mind. Um, anyone who doesn't follow these guidelines uh, may be asked to leave, but hopefully we won't get to that. Uh, we'll have loads of times for questions, so use Slido to submit those questions. For those of you who haven't used it before, there are instructions on screen for how to log on and submit your questions. You can also like other questions, um, so I'll you know, go to the questions that have the most upvotes uh, using the thumbs up option. If you don't know how to use it, there are lots of staff members here who can assist, and if you don't have a, a mobile device with you, they can also assist on that. Um, so that's most of the house housekeeping out of the way. So um, let's get started. We have a, a great panel to discuss those, those points. Um, I'm joined by Professor Jane Souter uh, uh, from the School of Communications in DCU, um, Ross Frenish, CEO of Mo Moonshot, Dr. Victoria Rusanaita, Director of Research and Analysis at Hybrid Centre of Excellence in Helsinki, and Art O'Leary, the CEO of Electoral Commission of Ireland. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Jane, can I start with you just so we can frame this conversation for everyone? What's the nature of disinformation we see in Ireland and how has it evolved over the years? Okay, so we, uh, we host the European Digital Media Observatory, the Irish Hub, that's uh, funded by the European Commission in, um, in DCU and Fuja. And so one of our jobs is obviously to be aware of the disinformation environment in Ireland. But I think the first thing um, that you have to kind of think about when you think about disinformation is what is it? And obviously the, the original kind of uh, definitions were around you know, deliberately misleading information and you had to be worried about the source and who actually did it and was it done deliberately and so on. Um, but that's very hard to, to actually get to. So we're much more inclined to actually think, well, what are the things that we're actually worried about when it, when it comes to disinformation or, uh, or misperceptions? Um, so what we're really concerned about are the sort of the negative uh, outlines that undermine public goods. So public confusion about vaccines, for example, would be, uh, would be something. And not everybody who spread dis information about vaccines might have done it deliberately. Some people might have done it um, by accident or because they actually believed it or <coughs> manipulation of the electoral process which Art will talk about later um, so these kind of things are the things that, uh, that we're worried about so we have to think about where it actually comes from and what happens and in the European Digital Media Observatory generally we see there are two sort of sources of disinformation and one is the sort of the FEMI stuff that we hear about in, from, uh, from Finland, which is often, you know, Russian generated or generated around there from Ukraine. But the other very much comes from the US and the UK. Um, and it's very different sort of issues. It's, um, it's about sowing division that can then be used later on. So the two things kind of uh, come together. So in Ireland, we find a really heavy focus on culture wars. You know, it started with a you know, heavy focus on immigration and a lot of the playbook coming from some of the things that we'd seen in the, in the US. But more recently, a lot of it is actually around uh, trans rights, for example. So this is an area where um, a lot of people have seen an opportunity to really drive division and uh, to drive polarization and undermine trust. So it's different kind of issues you know, in Ireland six years ago, trans rights were passed without any fuss, but now you can have 30 articles in a national newspaper in a weekend about it. 
Um, so it's something that's really been used to try to sow division and, uh, and sow, dist sow distrust. So we try to think about um, you know, how this happens and about um, we can't just be monitoring. It's about trying to uh, strengthen people's resilience, about not seeing people as weak. And um, I guess where we'd like to go to is to eventually start, and I, you know, I'm sure Sinead will bring us here, but having conversations about the importance of a really vibrant media system that's properly funded, you know, where fact-checking is embedded, about information literacy that you know, I'm sure Ross is going to be talk about, but also to think about what are the principles of good strategic comms and think about you know, how to um, anticipate what it is that uh, you know, actors who are trying to sow dissent what it is that they're going to focus on and think about how to react to that before it happens. Yeah, Victoria, those actors, uh, Jane mentioned there that you could discuss FEMI, which is foreign information manipulation and interference. Can you just tell us what that actually looks like? I think people will have an awareness since 2016 about Russian interference in the US, for example, but it obviously has evolved a lot since then, and we might not be very aware of exactly the, the actions that that interference looks like. So can you talk us through um, what, what it started as and how it has evolved? Thank you. Thank you, Sinead. This is a brilliant question, and I've loved how it was put also in the description of the panel uh, when uh, explaining or sort of emphasizing on the complexity uh, of the hybrid threat. Uh, so it is true that now the situation can be characterized by high complexity. So when we talk about hybrid threats, it's not only disinformation or not only cyber threats, but we more and more move towards uh, the special operations stuff. So uh, to the stuff you know that, that Sergei talked in the last panel about, uh, for example, unmanned uh, vessels or drones uh, used for spying, or that might be used for different types of diversions. Uh, and this, uh, or economic coercion, or illegal threats, or uh, you know, different military provocations. So this kind of forms this picture uh, of the threats that, uh, you know, goes from uh, influence to interference to then hybrid warfare. Uh, so when talking about how the hybrid threats uh, develop, it is very often based on the context that we're in, and the context that we're in today, of course, is the context of the war in, in Europe. So the threats um, uh, that we used to talk more about five years ago, so disinformation or cyber threats, they're still very important. They're the basis of how hostile actors do hybrid threats. So you go into this priming stage, you use the emotions already existing in the society, you mobilize th these emotions to achieve your desired goals, and to show those other hybrid events that happen in form of other types of interference in a certain light, and to show your own uh, policy choices also in a certain light. So in a sense, when we work with hybrid threats, it's never actor agnostic. So there is no separate disinformation threat flowing around uh, that you know, we must fight. Because if we will think about threats that we have to prepare for every threat, we will waste our state resources on everything because, you know, <laughs> there is no such resource. So we always think uh, also for the effectiveness of the approach that uh, there is a hostile actor behind the hostile campaign against a specific uh, uh, state. Uh, and it's also very important because you have to consider the strategic culture of the hostile actor when you think about the threat. So this information is not only flying around, and cyber threats are not only flying around, but they're used in a special way that is customary for that state and, uh, you know, based on how they do things. Uh, uh, so I think that's very important, the, seeing that there is a concrete hostile actor that is perpetrating those threats, and when you have this vision, you can then think about a strategy how to work with these threats. Is there a direct line then from the things you're talking about from misinformation or disinformation being step one and then you can move on more easily or readily to economic coercion or other, other hybrid threats? 
I, it's a very good question, right? Uh, so I think in contemporary societies, we're now faced uh, with this process when uh, emotions of people or like certain thought structures that uh, call out these emotions, strong emotions such as anger or such as disgust. Uh, so these thought processes are encouraged uh, by media, by social media, and so on. So this is the background we're living on. There is no hostile actor behind this. This is how we do stuff. Uh, but then uh, hostile actors are able to use these emotions, to mobilize these emotions for their specific causes. And, but of course, also political parties also do that. Uh, but the thing is, that with the hostile actors, it, it's, it's more difficult. They, they have aims against the states. That's why. Ross, I see you nodding there. Do we know more about the people who are susceptible to disinformation and if they're more susceptible to hostile actors or, um, like Victoria says, maybe stuff that we see as more benign? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. Um, I guess one of the things that we sometimes forget is how appealing um, disinformation is, how appealing extremism is. It's psychologically appealing to hear that you're the smart one in the room uh, and that everyone who disagrees with you is just a sheep. It's, there's, 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 there's a real kind of benefit to that. And I think if we don't understand the benefits to it, the benefits it provides to people who buy into, whether it be extremist narratives or disinformation narratives, um, then we're never going to be able to counter it. So I think that's definitely one, one part of it. Um, I mean, Victoria mentioned um, even just emotional uh, resonance. Um, we've been doing some work looking at um, hostile state disinformation in Poland and, again, have seen exactly the emotions you're talking about in terms of anger and disgust are used incredibly well by disinformation actors, incredibly well by extremists, far less well by um, kind of more mainstream journalists and mainstream communication. Now, is the answer to that that we need to up our disgust and our anger levels? Probably not. Um, there are a lot of things we can look at doing um, that can help us to undercut those, uh, those kind of narratives, which are more around understanding the commonly used structures <coughs> of these arguments, understanding how these things tend to be framed, um, and then thinking about how do we get that information out to the public. So I know we're going to get more to solutions later on. I don't want to jump ahead. But. Yeah, Jane, from what you're saying, those, those topics that bring up the emotions that are used by hostile actors, you, you touched on them a little bit there. Um, are there things that work in an Irish context um, more effectively um, at the moment? Yeah, so, we touch, so when we look at it, we don't see, you know, obviously we see some disinformation relating to Ukraine and, you know, people have even meant, you know, the health of Ukrainians coming in and so on. But it isn't, we don't see the same narratives that the, the media observatories in, in Poland and across Eastern Europe and even into Germany see. Um, they're not traveling that way. We see much more the kind of narratives coming from the... Um, the edges around uh, Trump in the US and, uh, and so on entering into Ireland. And it's probably because we're part of the English language ecosphere on social media, on Telegram and, um, and so on. So we see a lot more of, of, uh, of these kind of narratives and coming in. And a lot of it is based, some of it around kind of migration and international protection applicants and so on. And then, you know... Um, you see that played out in communities on, a, on occasion. But a lot of it um, that seems to travel more and seems to get more hits is actually around trans rights. And um, that can be framed in a way that what you're doing is protecting children and so on, or you're doing this or that. So it can get people very angry, and that anger can then be used by other actors um, to, to push things. So you see some of the trans right debate then is now in with the, um, the anti-vaccine debate, for example. Um, some of it is in around the, uh, the Ukraine, the, um, this is actually a proxy war for NATO kind of debate. You know, so you see all of these things getting mixed up in, uh, in different groups and used in different ways. Art, we framed the conversation there with some of the things we've, we're seeing in Ireland. From a, an electoral integrity point of view, is it something that you're worried about? And 
how are you envisioning going about the next six to 12 months? Yeah, I, I have four children, so nothing terrifies me anymore, <laughs> um, to, to be honest. But I, I, I'm sure this informed audience has all read part five of the Electoral Reform Act. Um, Just this morning. <laughs> which um, basically sets out the ambition of the House of the Oireachtas in relation to uh, dealing with misinformation and disinformation, because there is an understanding that in an electoral context, this can be very, very difficult, very, very challenging. And it's not something we can do by ourselves. You know, I mean, the Electoral Commission will be, on Comsun Tauchan, will be a very small organization that hopes to achieve everything it has to do by working with partners. So that's social media companies with academics, with media companies like the journal.ie, who invest so much in, in fact-checking. So the scale of the problem is enormous. But we are hoping that as time goes on, we are becoming more solutions-focused because I've been in rooms like this for the last two years listening to people articulate the problem absolutely perfectly. And we, it's only now in recent months where people like Ross are coming along saying, well, this is how we deal with it. I mean, pre-bunking, media literacy, all of these tools are now become available um, to bodies and organizations like Ancomishu and Taukhan to be able to deal with this because um, it's so important. You know, the, in the white hot heat of a general election campaign where it's three weeks, there's lots of information flying about everywhere, identifying misinformation and calling it out it will be a key part of what we have to do, but we can't do it by ourselves. It will be done in collaboration with partners. Victoria, how important in that work is it to recognise what is FEMI, what is foreign manipulation in an electoral sense? And does every country need to worry about it? I think there's some sense that, you know, oh, no one would interfere in an Irish process. Um, <coughs> but is that now, you know, too optimistic? You mean uh, how much do we have to worry about foreign interference uh, in election? Yeah. I'm not sure about Ireland, right? Uh, uh, just to, to the knowledge of, of, of the con context. Uh, but I think... In general, when we think about hybrid threats, it's good to be prepared, right? You just can't prepare to, to everything. So I think what Art has uh, just put out about pre-banking, for example, or like preparing in advance to, to other hybrid threats is immensely important. And at the hybrid COE, where I work, we uh, hold these exercises with our participating states where, you know, uh, we invite a whole-of-government approach group uh, and uh, they have to build a strategy against hybrid threats. So very often we come into the room and people don't know each other, you know. This is the first time they're meeting. And this is like this very basic thing that people haven't seen each other. Uh, but then what will they do when the crisis hits, you know? Probably some of them do know each other because they're from the security task ministries. So those three people from MOD, MFA, and MOI, once the crisis hits, they will meet and they will manage crisis after crisis after crisis. But the problem is, uh, and I think this panel is getting there uh, in a very good way, so the problem is that usually when we do crisis management, we don't have those voices that would be important to hear at the table because they're not managing security. So, uh, you know, uh, in some crisis, Ministry of Health, in some crisis, Ministry of Economy, Ministry of Energy, Ministry of Culture, these people should also be at the table. These people should also be strategizing uh, for the future uh, and, you know, uh, for the, let's say, deterrence of, of hybrid threats. Uh, so this forward-looking impression is, is very, very important, but also having people at the table, because if you don't have them uh, and you sit together when the crisis hits, you know, what kind of strategy do you get of uh, the people that are used to work with those problems? So th these are the usual decisions, and usual decisions get us to the situation that we are at now. We probably have that example from, the, we had a health uh, cyber attack and then an education cyber attack, so that probably proves that point. Um, just to stop briefly, and just if there are questions from the floor, if you just want to um, just, yeah, we have one there and one here. So I'll, I'll take this one here and then this one here. Um, there's a microphone floating around. Thank you, uh, Patricia McKenna. Um, I, uh, just in relation to sowing dissent, it reminds me of 
the other term, which is manufacturing consent. And I think we have to recognise that within society there are all sorts of different views. And how you actually allow all those views to be heard, like me personally, you know, on the issue of, for example, on migration, I get appalled at the, you know, the anti kind of, you know, the comments about black people and foreigners, etc. I find it extremely disturbing and annoying. But I don't think the way to control that is by just trying to cut all of these views of opinion out. Instead, there should be proper balanced debate. Because I think a lot of people, when you talk to them, you can actually get people to see things from another perspective. And I just wonder, in relation to this, this whole discussion this morning, it's, it's an extremely complex subject, uh, because we're talking about disinformation and about different opinions. It is about different opinions. Disinformation sometimes can be about, well, you, for example, the state, the government. We had I mean, disinformation, we had a good example from our national broadcaster this week in relation to disinformation. But disinformation from the state's point of view can be that they feel it's disinformation. I've been, uh, you know, the target of that for many years. I was campaigning on the militarisation of the EU. Sorry, Patricia, I'm just... Sorry, we've loads just of questions since 1987. Yeah. And this whole forum is basically, you know copper fastening that what I said was actually correct, but at that time I was accused of disinformation and of scaremongering, but no one can now go back and look at my words and say that I was disinforming or scaremongering. And I think we have to be very careful. There's a difference between conspiracy and fact yeah. sometimes, and that's time. Yeah, you've touched on a couple of questions that we have in the slider as well. We'll just take this question from the floor and then I might uh, go to the panel. Actually, not unrelated to Patricia's point, which is, uh, I mean, we're all here today with the kind of the sheen of participative democracy, but of course it has died. Just, you, just to introduce yourself. So yeah, sorry, I'm Nasa Harrigan. I'm a TD for Dublin Central. Um, you know, this process has a sheen of participatory democracy, but obviously it sidesteps the one the state has actually adopted over the past few years, which is citizens' assemblies. Um, and so, you know, I suppose I would put it to the panel that, that this forum itself is actually becoming an engine of disinformation. Even in the last session, there were some hair-raising, easily disproved statements that went completely unchallenged. And they are now in the public sphere under the sponsorship of a very senior politician in government. So I would put it to the panel that both in its existence, in the fact that we're all in this room today, but also in its content, this is an engine of state disinformation. I'm just going to group because we had another question from Scott Fitzsimons in the, Fitzsimmons in the room from the University of Limerick um, and it touches on some of the things that Patricia said as well. How can the desire to prevent the spread of internet, intentional disinformation be balanced against the right to freely express falsehoods on the basis of one's ignorance? Ross, you might take that for us. Uh, yeah, happy to. I mean, there's a right to be repugnant in a democracy. There are many things that people can say that I find personally repugnant that shouldn't be banned, that shouldn't be undermined, that shouldn't be, uh, certainly shouldn't have the eye of the state uh, rested upon someone. Um, and even the, the conversation mentioned earlier, like some of the techniques being used by political parties. So we, we deal with this a lot. I chair a, um, a working group at the EU on communications and narratives. And we're constantly trying to walk that line between what is disinformation, what is extremism, and what is repugnant free speech or repugnant political activism. And I think it's incredibly important that we, we have that front and center constantly because the risk that the state puts it, its eye on the citizens who disagree, who have views that I find repugnant, many people in this room might find repugnant, might be minority views, is huge. So I think that's something we need to take incredibly seriously. Um, this is partly why some of the methodologies that are most effective at countering disinformation and misinformation actually don't involve enforcement at all. Um, so there's a, uh, a project that we're working on in partnership with Jigsaw, actually, which is part of Alphabet and Google um, in Germany and elsewhere on uh, pre-bunking, which is essentially an educational project which uses the um, uses online advertising tools, uses um, other methodologies like that to teach citizens what common manipulation tactics are. So conscious de decontextualization and other things are things that are used constantly. Pre-bunking is one of these, is, a, is an academically, uh, academically rigorous methodology which has been used in everything from 
uh, misinformation to anti-smoking ads. Um, so it's not about lining up each of the falsehoods and knocking them down one by one. It's about training citizens um, to recognize this stuff when they come up and whether or not then future disinformation comes from extremist groups, comes from hostile state actors, or heaven forbid, comes from the state itself, the citizens are then equipped to deal with that. And that sidesteps a lot of that issue around free speech. Can you give us an example of an effective pre-bunking campaign? Yeah, so um, these, there's, there's one that uh, we actually um, have been, we're now rolling out across Germany. It was, it was, it was piloted um, in Poland, the Czech Republic, and Slovakia, I believe, um, which did exactly that. What we tried to do is to, um, we purchased up the advertising space in and around um, things which are often spreading disinformation, misinformation, malinformation, um, and ran short educational videos so that people could understand um, the commonly used fear-mongering <coughs> techniques, commonly used decontextualization techniques. And then we ran pre- and post-tests to see are the audiences able to recognize this when it comes up, um, those who have consumed the video, um, compared to a comparison group. So this is a really practical thing um, that was tested in those countries and now being rolled out across Germany, Indonesia, and in the future we're going to be rolling out across India. Um, and you know, I, I'm sure Ash knows this as well, and everyone on the panel does, um, this stuff surges hugely in and around elections, um, which is where, from, to my money, pre-bunking is quite useful because we're not going through and we're saying, this is wrong and this is wrong. Because we saw in like the Hunter Biden laptop story, what's true and what isn't true, what's disinformation and what's, and what's not, it's really, hard to, it's really hard to nail down. Whereas if you take a step back from, um, from, from that fact-checking uh, fact and equip people with the tools they need themselves, you make your democracy more resilient and you make sure that you're, you're uh, avoiding some of those issues of free speech suppression. Jane, in your work, have you seen that, that people who are maybe used to fact-checking are evolving and doing more of this pre-bunking? Yeah, no, absolutely. Because one like fact-checking is useful for people afterwards. It's useful if it's embedded in uh, a media culture so people can go back to it if they're having discussion with friends and family and say, oh, well, that was fact-checked. But usually it doesn't actually reach the same people that the manipulative content uh, reached. And also a lot of things aren't even quite fact-checkable. You know what I mean? It's not clear whether they're right or wrong. It depends on your perspective and so on. So it's really about... Um, teaching people core critical thinking skills so as they can look at content and think about are they being manipulated and what are the techniques that might be being used to manipulate them. Is there strong man arguments? Is there what aboutism? Is there different things? So you do the you make the little videos. We've done some of this with researchers in the University of Cambridge where we've just put in those, uh, made little videos with those basic kind of logical fallacies, call it fallacy finders. Um, they've been tested so far in the US and the UK on social media. And the advantage of them is that they make the people feel smart then when they see the technique being used on them, whoever it is being doing it. Because, you know, as Ross was saying earlier, one of the things about conspiracy theories is that they make people feel smart because, you know, they're the one who thinks something different to everybody else. But if you can actually give them the techniques to spot manipulative techniques, then they're the person who feels smart, smart when they spot them. So it really helps people. And it's just about teaching kind of good philosophical foundations of, uh, of good cognitive thinking and about being able to spot logical fallacies. Because that, that's ultimately what's used by people who are uh, trying to manipulate or trying to use um, conspiracies or, or so on. So it's about pe increasing people's capacity to uh, help them navigate what's an increasingly complex information environment. Yeah, Victoria, a lot of disinformation, wherever it starts, it's actually spread by ordinary people who, for some reason or another, distrust the information they're getting from state bodies or, uh, you know, established uh, media companies. What can governments and media do to increase or win back some of the trust that has been lost in, in this fight against the, 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 the foreign interference? I think this is a very important question, and uh, uh, it's also very important to underline that freedom of speech is the basis of democracy. So, of course, people have the right to their opinions, and, you know, people have the right to being right, to being wrong, to being, uh, you know, to misunderstand stuff. So they have this right, and uh, for government, what is important to do uh, 
I think my colleagues mentioned that bril brilliantly. So specific media literacy programs, this, of course, this works in a long term. You need time, you need patience, but in the end, this patience will uh, pay off. Uh, Ross, there's a question here from uh, Stephen Kieran. Um, what is the panel's view about making it mandatory for social media companies to seek identity verification for all accounts? So this is obviously a huge part of disinformation. It spreads on social media. Yeah, the, there's a, this again, everything needs to be balanced. Um, I've seen this quite often, that uh, this idea that if everybody had just their own name, um, then no, people wouldn't be quite as repugnant. Um, I would encourage anybody who thinks that to spend time in the comments section under Facebook, uh, where I've seen much worse things with people's name, their photograph, them and their kids, than I have uh, even on Twitter, which, you know, Patriot567 actually is a, is, a, is a model of elegance compared to some of these lads uh, elsewhere. But I also think we, it's very important that we need to see this in a global context. We're here talking about disinformation inside Ireland. But the, the tech companies in Ireland, the technology based in Ireland, is affecting the entire planet. Um, and when we think about identity verification, we think about forcing people to, um, to, 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 to use their real names. In an Irish context where the human rights of those of activists and others are protected, that makes sense. In authoritarian states, they, they would be only delighted if everybody had to use their real name uh, all the time. They'd be only delighted if the technology companies had access to all of this information. So I think that in an Irish context, I can see how one would l want that to be the case. But in a global context, I do think there's some serious downsides to forcing identity verification when we're thinking about authoritarian states, thinking about democracy activists, or thinking about others. And we in Ireland, and we in this room, and I hope in this panel, we need to think beyond just ourselves. Um, we need to defend our democracy, yes, but we also have these major technology companies based in Ireland, and the disinformation, misinformation, malinformation that's spreading in sub-Saharan Africa, that's spreading in Southeast Asia, spreading elsewhere, that's leading to mob violence and others, much of it is passing through social media companies that are based here, that we derive profit from, that is passing through servers that are, and, and data centers that are based here. So I think our conversation on this needs to think about, yes, how we defend ourselves, but also what we can do, how Ireland can lead on this and help defend the rest of the world and equip the rest of the world to defend itself against um, uh, issues that are spread using companies that we profit from as a nation. So, sorry, that was a bit of a longer speech than... than, than uh, just to, when you're all talking, guys, just speak towards the microphone just so the people at the back of the room can... That's a bit of housekeeping from South Victoria. You want to come in that as well? I just wanted to add one point about amplification. So... Uh, I don't know exactly the statistics, but they go around this, that about 50% of internet traffic on social media is by robots. So robots do not have rights to free speech. And what do they do? They do amplify malign content, you know? So there needs to be also a policy to, to target this amplification uh, of malign messages, not necessarily, you know, opinions as such, but the processes, how they get out there. Jane, you wanted to come in on data as well there. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I think one of the, the key things that Ireland and, and Europe can do is really try to um, negotiate harder with the, with the platforms and the social media companies for access to the appropriate data that researchers can actually um, discover what is happening, how it's happening, how information is travelling and so on. You know, the, the platforms can answer a lot of these questions themselves um, they choose not to. There's a little bit of that in the DSA, but there could be um, an awful lot more. And I think it's absolutely crucial that the uh, that Europe does actually ensure that uh, researchers get access to, to this data to really properly understand what's happening. Just take another moment to see if there's any questions from the floor. There's a good few hands gone up there. So we'll just take three and then we'll go here, here, and then one at the back there. If you just introduce yourself as well, please. Sure. Um, uh, my name is uh, Neil O'Sullivan. I'm an independent podcaster. I'd like to ask a question about economic coercion, which is also mentioned in your agenda. And maybe just to give a little bit of context, sometimes, you know, you see comments on social media that Ireland is a neutral country. We're small. Everybody loves us. Why would anybody want to hurt us? Or to put it another way, you know, what might we have that anybody could possibly want? And, and I think uh, one of the things that Ireland has that, that particularly authoritarian regimes may want, they may want to control our voice. And they may want to control the voice of our representatives in fora like at the UN or in the European Parliament. 
and they may want to control what our politicians say in their public statements, or maybe not say. Um, in Ireland, you know, we operate on the principles of democracy, free speech, we observe the international rules-based order, we expect our elected representatives to speak up for our values, for human rights, for the principles of democracy, and being neutral, I think, shouldn't affect this. And while Irish politicians have been very critical uh, on Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, we, in contrast, we hear very little criticism about the behaviour of the Chinese Communist Party. And I think this is very surprising given China's own strong statements and supports for Russia. And you may recall that, uh, you know, a few months ago, Xi Jinping visited Russia. And uh, according to the CCP, uh, that was to deepen his ties with Russia. Sorry, and also, all the while... We'll wait, just we will get to the other questions as well. So okay. we'll get your question. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Ursula von der Leyen has also been very clear on economic coercion and the dangers coming from China. So the question is this. If a powerful authoritarian regime is to target a small country like Ireland with economic and trade coercion, how effective can they be? Can they silence our political leaders from criticizing them and speaking up for our values? And how concerned should we be? And finally, what mechanisms are in place or should be put in place to eliminate or reduce this risk? Great. Thank Thanks you. so much. We'll take this one here, and then there's one at the back as well. Yeah. Thank you. Um, David Geary. Um, I have a question in relation to um, uh, Ireland's approach um, and FTI policy in relation to um, big tech and whether this is causing a problem for ourselves and others. And we have um, a benign regulatory environment as part of our FDI offering. I think that's well known to not just to big tech industry but to all industries. Um, but as regards big tech, um, for example, the Competition Authority is strangely disinterested in um, investigating dominance of markets, which is not the case in, in other European countries, for example. Our data protection regulator um, was slow to take a robust approach, um, as we've seen in a number of recent cases. And I think internationally no one seriously believes that Ireland is going to take a robust approach to regulating big tech or enforcing um, norms against big tech. So my question then is, um, has Ireland created a problem for its own democracy through its um, uh, benign offering, um, regulatory uh, offering to big tech? And um, are we failing our European partners, um, as this is uh, a matter of systemic importance to um, European democracies, and as I think Ross said, uh, are we failing the wider world by taking such a soft touch approach to um, our big tech investors? Thank, Thank you. you. And then there was one down the back. If the person wants to put up their hand again, and we'll take one more and then go back to the panel. Yeah, it's this man in the green here. Yeah. Uh, Park, Park Manion is, my, is my name. Um, I have a question on Slido, but just as a, 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 different, a different question uh, also. <coughs> Um, uh, on like firstly, like this mostly has, has been dealing with uh, sort of security from a military uh, point of point of view, uh, whereas as I understand it, uh, cyber security and everything related to that is strictly a police matter. Uh, it's not got nothing to do with armies. You don't create cyber security by having tanks uh, or more or, or more uh, airplanes. Uh, so like firstly, it's, it's a security matter. So I wonder how central it is to, to, to the debate. <coughs> Uh, but but certain, sec secondly, uh, the, the question of like, whether or not we always have to look, uh, you know, to, to to Russia or to to, to China, you know, when like like the most sort of obvious major uh, attack, you know, sort of disinformation, for example, has been the whole myth of um, weapons of mass destruction uh, leading to the uh, Iraq War, and they didn't exist. They couldn't have existed. Anybody would, uh, who understood either weapons or airplanes, could know that. And yet it started a war <coughs> which killed millions or thousands of people uh, and caused it a, a, major, a major issue. Uh, and I think sometimes we recognize their problem, but we place the locus of the problem in the wrong place. Thank you. Thanks very much. Victoria, I might ask you to group a couple of those questions together in terms of the foreign actors. Um, should we be as worried about China as we are about Russia, and where does America come in? We might group th those those questions together for you. 
could you kindly re rephrase the second question? Yeah, so um, Neil and uh, the last speaker there brought, brought up, Pork brought up, um, that China uh, is, is an actor that we don't hear a huge amount about, and should we be as worried about them as we are about Russia? Um, okay, that, that's a very good question and <coughs> very important uh, right now. Um, so how likely are they to target a small state, China? Well, it depends on the stakes that they've got in that state. Uh, you know, so how concerned should we be? We should be very concerned. We should look at the stakes that they have. And what China has been known to be doing is investing in critical infrastructure uh, across Europe, uh, also in the terms that's very uh, convenient to them and inconvenient to the states who take loans. So the states uh, are likely to lose that infrastructure to China. And again, this is you know, a stage of priming. We don't know what will they do with that infrastructure yet, but it's there, they're purchasing it. So it might be put into use in the future. Uh, so yes, we should be very concerned and we should look into that in separate states. And of course, China's approach is very different to Russia's. So uh, China is an actor which has money, but it also has uh, its own foreign policy goals and, uh, you know, its own understanding how the world should be arranged, uh, that it would be just to uh, China. Uh, and Pork also brought up uh, the U.S. and the Iraq war and the weapons of mass destruction piece of uh, disinformation. Uh, Ross, is there anything you wanted to say to that point? Yeah, and a couple of the wider points as well. I mean, the question at the back around, um, you know, information operations is, uh, versus defense. It's like information operations have always been part of, uh, have always been part of military operations. The, this idea that it's de tanks and soldiers over here and information over here isn't true. I mean, the siege of Munster, they were literally firing bluntened arrows over the walls with coils of paper to undermine the, that Munster was taken over by an extremist sect, um, to undermine the ideas inside the walls at 600 years ago. So information operations are clearly within the remit of defense, always have been. Um, and then when it comes to uh, the, you know, the, the fact that these tech companies are actually based here, I think this is, in some ways, we have an obligation, but we also have an opportunity to actually do something with that. Um, I was a reservist for six years, so I always think about how the reserve could potentially help um, in this instance. And I think about the Silicon Docs and the people that are there and the talent that's there and think about how could we put that to work defending the state? How could we put that to work defending our allies and uh, UN missions and others? And, you know, there are bodies... In the UK military, they set up something called the 77th Brigade, which is specifically set up for information warfare, information operations, which hired people directly from technology companies and others as reservists to build that internal capability. So I think the fact that we have a, a reserve force has been, has been d diminished to the point of near non-existence. And the fact that we then have that, we almost have a blank sheet of paper. We also have a massive amount of talent in this state that could be put to work on information operations to help defend the state and to help defend our allies and elsewhere, I think we need to be much more forward-looking and we need to think much, much more positively about the role we can play, not just defending ourselves, but defending others, and the reserve needs to be front and center. Uh, the final piece I would say on that is there's questions around weapons of mass destruction and elsewhere, and these things. This stuff gets brought up all the time. I mean, the question I would have um, not just on information operations and misinformation, but on wider defense, is um, if you want us to be independent of um, all allies and, uh, and, and others who may be pushing this stuff, well, then we need to invest in our capability, um, whether that's information capability or defense capability. If Whether it's you don't trust the British or you don't trust the, the Russians or the Chinese or the Americans or whoever else it is, it's like, well, at that stage, then you need to invest in your own capability to protect your own neutrality, protect your own state, protect your own democracy. Um, so there's no free lunch here as well. So whether or not you think it's coming from China or you, you think it's coming from America, ultimately, um, we need to take responsibility for ourselves, for defending our own state, for defending our own democracy, and that means investment in these capabilities. And on that point then, Art, David's question about his the perception that the regulators here have a, a lot of work to do and, and not, a, not a lot of teeth in, in his words. Um, where do you think that puts Ireland in an international um, discussion on this? Yeah, well, I, I, I think for the people who've been listening to this conversation for the last 45 minutes, I, I think you're getting a sense now of the scale of the challenge which faces um, all uh, government bodies and, um, and independent bodies as well. 
we are an organisation that has is in existence just for four months now, and so our challenge is to establish ourselves as a, an expert and credible and trusted source of information in relation to electoral matters. And that has to happen very quickly. We need to scale up very quickly and, um, and do that. On the, the point about um, uh, regulatory bodies in this country, I can only speak for on Commission Tauhan um, when I say that we were established by the House of the Oireachtas to be absolutely independent. We don't report to government. We don't report to the Custom House. We report via the House of the Oireachtas, and we do that through many reporting mechanisms. But one of the really important ones which has gone under the radar is that we have um, the responsibility to do post-electoral um, audits of, after every single electoral event. And this, every time we have an electoral event, and we will have seven of them in the next 28 months, it provides an opportunity for learning. We have to be versatile and robust and learn from every occasion and report back to the Oireachtas and make further recommendations for electoral reform. This is a key part of, um, of what we have to do. And like I said previously, I mean, we won't do this by ourselves. The solutions to the, the global challenges here won't be found um, just here alone. It's beyond our shores. I mean, um, I did, I've looked at some of the work done by ele election management bodies and other election commissions. And the, in Australia, for instance, they have um, that they've started a stop and consider campaign in relation to um, trusted sources of information. But they've also interestingly created a misinformation and disinformation register. So every time they capture misinformation, they put it on their website. And you can go and look at a list of things that people have said, and it comes back again to calling out misinformation if and when um, you see it. Because in the white hot heat of an election campaign, when there is so much information floating about, then um, we have to be quick, we have to be versatile and responsive in a way that many Irish regulatory bodies may not always have been accused of. Jane, you might want to touch on that question around light touch regulation um, as well, but I'm just going to bring in one other question from the floor as well from Rose Fleming on Slido. Disinformation tends to be shared from free articles and the truth can be behind a paywall. Do you think the rise in subscriptions for reputable publications has contributed to disinformation by impeding access to truthful information? No, I don't think so necessarily because, you know, before that Jack actually had to go out and buy a newspaper. So, uh, you know, it was only for a very short period of time that, you know, the, um, that, all, that all news was, uh, was free. But I think what that question does point to is the, is the importance of a really plural, really good media environment. And for that, we need to fund it. And we know that the, um, the amount of advertising revenue that is now diverted to the platforms means that media is under serious pressure, under serious financial pressure. So I think... Uh, the other recently established uh, body with the new Media Commission definitely has a job of work to do. I think it should probably support like the, the fact-checking that the journal does is supported through EDMO, which is via the European Commission. But I think probably other media organisations should be supported to do that through funding. Um, perhaps more foreign news can be supported. All sorts of different campaigns can be um, can be supported, and I think we need to think about this in terms of a really plural uh, media environment. And just quickly in terms of regulation, Ireland can't act on its own. We're a member of the, of the European Commission. We're going to enact European legislation, including the Digital Services Act and so on, the European Media Freedom Act. So it's not as if, you know, Ireland's wish for light-touch regulation can mean that we do something completely different to the rest of Europe. So I think that cooperation is impossible. Can I just come back to one really quick earlier point? So uh, NASA brought up, should this not be a citizen assembly rather than uh, this <coughs> venue? Like, I've always been a really firm advocate of citizens assembly, but I don't see why it's a binary choice. I don't see that, you know, because we're having this here, that it doesn't mean that there can't be a citizen assembly later on. In fact, I hope there probably will be at, at some point. Ross, did you want to come in on that as well? Oh, it was, uh, the, it was the earlier point Jay made about the, uh, the, the money flowing to the technology companies. I mean, globally, media is being decimated by technology companies. That, that money is flowing to tech companies that are ba based here and that we generate tax revenue from. So again, this comes back to, I, I think, Ireland thinking about its role 
in the disinformation misinformation space globally, um, because the money flows from those co from from those papers to the companies to this state, and I think this state needs to think about information warfare, disinformation misinformation with a global lens, because we're the ones profiting from from this stuff. And, and I couldn't agree more about the uh, citizens' assembly. I don't see that it's disinformation to have people sitting on a stage having a conversation. Um, in fact, I was I was struck. I've been working in security uh, in one form or another my entire adult life, I have never seen um, something that's so open that where people can just come and talk about this. The fact that the interruption of the of the Taunishda's remarks is there on YouTube. You can listen and hear everything that, 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 that is being said. There's no attempt to suppress it. People, different viewpoints are being heard. So I would come a little bit to the defense of this and, and say I think it's probably not useful to say that just the existence of this is itself state disinformation. I, I wasn't told what to say. No one else here was told what to say. And I think we need to give some credit to the organizers for the fact that we're all independent and we're, we're here talking and the people from the <laughs> We'll take some more questions. We'll take that opportunity to take some more questions. There's one at the back there. He had his hand up earlier. And then we'll come to you. I know you had your hand up as well. If you just introduce yourself and stand up so everyone can hear you, that'd be great. Thank you. Sorry, can everyone hear me? Yes, yeah, sorry. My name's Saren Fogarty. I'm Parliamentary Assistant Senator Alice Mary Higgins. And just to agree with Deputy Horrigan's earlier comments, uh, but my question is, when disinformation starts having effects on public policies, as we've seen in Europe through the disinformation about migrants particularly, has resulted in, you know, really racist policies and hardening of borders coming through even the recently negotiated pact on migration and asylum. How do you counter that? That's because <clears throat> we've seen it seep into public policy, not just into the electoral sphere, but when people are making decisions about how we live together. So that's um, my question for the panel. Great, thank you. There's one here at the front and then this other gentleman in the suit. Um, my name is Sean Quinn. I, I was looking at this last night, new and emerging threats and then Tina G had uh, the Edward Snowden film on uh, by Oliver Stone. And it's, it's about how the US National Security Agency is monitoring everybody all over the world. Now, uh, Ireland is important to United States interests. We have all these cables connecting us. Uh, we're kind of like the USS Ireland. And we, we have them using Shannon and what have you. So my question is, uh, is the United States a threat to our personal security? Great. Thank you very much. And just one more here, and then we'll go back to the panel. Thank you. Uh, the RTE scandal is justifiably getting major media attention if you because could of lack of integrity. introduce yourself first, that would be great. Thank you. Yes, Edward Horgan. Hi, Edward. Thank you. Um, and misinformation... Uh, on salaries. It's very likely that accountability will be achieved for these RTE issues. Thankfully, nobody died because of the RTE scandal. A much more serious scandal has been ongoing for the past two decades, involving successive Irish governments due to serious breaches of Irish neutrality and international laws. Ireland had been actively complicit in US and NATO-led wars in the Middle East due to US military use of Shannon Airport. Unlike the RTE scandal, millions of people have died due to war-related reasons across the wider Middle East, including one million children. Over these four days, a very one-sided consultation, we've heard little about the disastrous Middle East wars from our former generals, academics and foreign experts. The Irish government bears a proportion of responsibility for the deaths of each of these children. When you kill a child, you destroy that child's whole life and destroy all its human rights. This is why Irish neutrality is important um, to prevent our involvement in the slaughter of the innocents. Our government must also stop lying and giving misinformation about Irish neutrality. Ireland is now not neutral by any definition of neutrality. We must restore Irish neutrality by ending US use of Shannon Airport and British Air Force agreement to operate in Irish airspace. We have no capacity to be a military power despite the wishes of our amateur generals. Our government wants us to adopt a scattergun approach to overseas missions 
for our defence forces, including inappropriate missions at times with NATO or European Union. Sorry, Edward, can we, if you have a specific question for the and panel, that would be great. My question is, the, the best interests of all Irish people, including our diaspora, and the best interests of all humanity are best served by restoring genuine, positive Irish neutrality. And we need accountability for Irish complicity in the Middle East killings. When will this accountability be achieved? Thank you. Thanks so much. Victoria, I might ask you to take the first question there about how disinformation can impact policy. Do you have examples of that happening, or how can we fend against that? So definitely, if disinformation is perpetrated by the hostile acts, or let's say Russia in the Baltic states, they seek to uh, have an influence on uh, different kind of policies, and they seek to sow disagreements uh, within the society. Uh, so I think to the countering, Ross might be a, a better person, more knowledgeable with on-the-ground methods uh, <laughs> how to do that. But I think stuff has been mentioned already in this panel uh, before, so pre-banking, media literacy, but also diminishing the opportunity for robots to kind of uh, shape our I information space. Uh, that would be useful. Thanks very much, yeah, for passing me the difficult one. Um, yeah, the, so the, the, I obviously I totally agree with that. Um, I guess there's, I'm trying to stay on the path of what this panel is about rather than straying into the wider, the wider conversation. Um, but I do think that there's, there's some genuine questions here, and disagreement is not a bad thing, about whether Ireland should work with friends and allies and specialise or whether we should, have, we should pay for a broader defence and cover our airspace and, 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 and all the rest of it. Um, personally, I believe we should specialise, and I think that dismiss and malinformation, um, cyber and information operations is an area that Ireland is very, very well suited to specialise in. I think if we're going to invest in defence, I think we should invest in things where we have a natural strength on the one hand, and where, secondly, we also have a degree of complicity um, when it comes to this stuff spreading, given the data centres that are here. So... I think that as a as a as a as a you know as we f try and figure out what our strategy is going to be, I would personally advocate picking a few things that we're very very good at, specialising in those things, taking responsibility for the, uh, the the harms that we're somewhat complicit in as well, and then allowing friends and others to to to, to help us in those areas where we have less special special um, uh, uh, knowledge. I personally wouldn't advocate NATO. I think closer cooperation with our partners is, makes more sense. Um, but it's really a question of what we specialise in. And I think what this panel is talking about, this is an area we should focus really, really heavily on. Yeah, and I'm not skipping over your question, Sean, but I think uh, the guys answered the US question earlier. And I wanted to get to one other question oh. from Slido. Does anyone want to go back to the US question? Victoria, you... you... The answer is no. And a question from Slido. There is often a marked difference in results of online-only polls versus in-person polls in Ireland, indicating clear manipulation of online-only polls by bad actors. Has the panel seen this elsewhere in the world? Jane, your work with Edmo might have brought this up. Um, I'm not sure what the Slido questionnaire means by online-only polls. Like, if they mean uh, some of the polling companies who are actually members of the, the marketing and polling or organisation, IMRO, like... As far as I know, Red Sea does online only polls, so do MRBI, so do BNA, and those have exactly the same high standards as the in person polls. And in fact, they can often get to people who in person polls can't get to because of access and you know, new apartment blocks and all of that kind of thing. So perhaps by online only polls, they mean just a random poll by somebody on Facebook, which just goes to the people who they follow. Um, well then, yes, but that's about information literacy, it's about understanding what is good polling, it's about understanding representative samples, it's about understanding margins of error. Um, so that's just part of uh, information uh, literacy. And actually, just talking about information literacy, the one other thing I'd say um, about it, like in Edna, and I'm sure Ross does this as well, but we have a big thing where... We work with librarians um, around the country, so the librarians are very trusted. Um, and older people especially uh, go to libraries as well as uh, very young children. And there, um, Edmo does actually have tools around um, information literacy in Ireland for older people who often inadvertently 
um, spread conspiracies and other material that, that may not be true and sometimes might relate to migration and, and so on. So it's useful, I think, to work with the libraries in, in terms of some of that kind of protection around some of those rumours that, that go around. Art. Yeah, just on the point of polling, um, the, one of the key priorities of on Comisión Tauhoan this year is to es finally establish a, a national election and democracy study, which will involve interviewing in real time um, thousands of individuals, not like an exit poll, which just captures the views of people who vote, but we need to start capturing the people who don't vote, understand why they don't vote, etc. So in the years ahead, we're going to have a huge volume of data which we'll make publicly available to everybody um, to use so we can see. So there's a transparency um, to the polling, um, the real data that it could be potentially hugely valuable to us as a society. I just have a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to take a question which might sum up some of our chat today from Neil Richardson. To what extent do the panel believe disinformation activities to date have, may have impacted the Irish public? And Jane, you touched on it there with older people spreading uh, conspiracies, um, sometimes, you know, for, for no bad reasons. Um, so you might speak to that first and then I'll go through the panel. Sure, like we saw it in the beginning with the, with the vaccines, you know, quite often grandparents would um, share information about MMR even with their, with their grandchildren, you know, with their children concerned about their grandchildren. Even though they didn't really believe it, they'd see something on Facebook and think, oh, I wonder, is there something in this? And they want to be protective of their family, so they'll inadvertently share this kind of information that we, that we know wasn't correct. So it's just a lot of older people grew up in an environment where the information environment uh, was trusted. You know, there was the public sector broadcaster, there was a few newspapers, so you did believe what you read. Um, and so I think it's really important to, uh, to work with older people to help them understand some of that information literacy as, as well as the focus of course on uh, younger people in, in schools and so on. But people often share information for all sorts of reasons, not always uh, out of bad motives, often out of good motives where they, they want to protect their loved ones as well. And Ross, that same question to you, to what extent do the panel believe disinformation activities have impacted the Irish public to date? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think other panellists are better suited, so uh, I think, of course, they've impacted. No one is immune from this. Um, sometimes people think they are and, and they're not. Um, highly educated people can be, can, can be uh, victimised by this as well. So, yeah, there's no doubt that this has impacted us. But I also think we need to think about not just what's happened in the last few years, but while we're thinking about building state capacity, we need to think about what are the issues going to be in five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Because if we're going to build our capacity as a state to defend our democracy, to defend our allies, to fulfill our ethical obligations, we need to start laying the groundwork for that right now and thinking about what are those future threats, what are the future things that could happen with uh, dismiss and malinformation and information operations and how do we defend ourselves against that. So I really think it's important we look forward um, and take full responsibility, not just for defending ourselves, but for um, fixing some of the things that have taken place on because of the rise of technology companies that have been largely positive but have some negative externalities, one of which is the thing we're talking about today. Great. Thanks, Ross. I'm actually going to sneak in one last question because it's the most voted up one on Slido from Stephen Kieran, And it's probably not exactly on this panel, but because you're here, Art, I'll ask you, would the panel agree having an electoral register that is linked to a citizen's unique identifier, like a PPS number in Ireland, is a key measure in combating voting fraud? Yeah, it, 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 it's a brilliant question. And um, I think for decades, people have been complaining about the electoral register. There's a brilliant project going on in the Custom House right now to do exactly that. Um, and you, you may have heard ads on the radio and television in the, just this week where we encourage people to go and check the register and you have the opportunity to update um, your own record, include your PPS number, etc. because this unique identifier will help us eliminate duplicates because, as we know, we're, um, we're really good in this country at pu putting people on the register at every single address that they've ever lived in. <laughs> uh, and, and, but, but, but we're not great at taking them off. Um, so if you travel through Bedsitland in Rath Mines, um, if you go into the, the hallway, you'll discover dozens and dozens of polling cards, etc. So this project, which is scheduled to um, conclude in the next year or so, it's a collaboration between the Custom House and all the local authorities, um, will eliminate that in about 18 months' time. 
we should have something close to a bulletproof electoral register, and um, that's a great starting point for us to be able to measure properly turnout and, um, and then also measure the success of an Comisión Falcón in relation to our, one of our functions to enhance uh, turnout and to improve public engagement in electoral politics. So check the registers.ie. Do it when you go home. Don't let it go past tomorrow. Thank you. I was about to say I didn't think we'd end this panel on a a public announcement about checktheregister.ie, but here we are. Uh, You actually have a 20-minute break now, so you can go checktheregister.ie if you want. Uh, We'll be starting again at 11.45, so you, you have some freedom for the next few minutes. Thank you.
Wait, what? Yeah. Um, good afternoon. I'm not sure good afternoon is right. But, uh, if you could have everybody at the door and people coming in and take the seats, um, we're going to start the next session. Eamon Marte is going to be the moderator and I'll hand over to him now. Hello everyone and thank you for uh, being with us today. I uh, hope everybody's suitably caffeinated and uh, for what should be a very interesting session that we're going to have on the topic of Defence Forces Capability Development. I'm uh, very uh, glad to be joined by Brigadier General Ross Mulcahy, Aileen Nolan, Director of Emergency Operations Infrastructure Oversight in the Department of Defence, Dr Rory Finnegan, Assistant Professor in Military History and Strategic Studies, and then finally, Conor Kerwin, Capability Director in the European Defence Agency. Uh, before I, I open with a, a number uh, of the, the panel discussion, I, I just want to just remind people about the, 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 the principles of the participation in, in the forum today. So we will be using Slido. As you can see, the, the um, means to use Slido is set up on the screen behind me. It, in terms of the principles of the forum, we were going to operate in, in the spirit of openness and inclusiveness, so no personal attacks or personalised criticisms at all. If I can ask people when they're asking questions, when I go to the floor to give their name and also to keep the questions succinct to enable as many questions as possible. In the spirit of uh, greater participation, I'll try and focus the, the questions to those who have yet to ask a question, so people, please feel free to put up your hand and ask questions. Uh, we do encourage you to use Slido as much as possible, which will increase the participative nature of the, of the, the session, and uh, you can give a thumbs up to those questions that you see on Slido that are uh, of most interest to yourselves. So, to commence the, the, the discussion and really to grant. Well, I, I suppose I'm interested in facilitating discussion as much as possible, so I take your point. But we'll use Slido as well to, to ensure that we get as broad a range of questions as, as possible. So at that point, and just to commence the discussion, and really to ground the discussion on the area of capability development, I, I think, Aileen, I, I'll turn to you for just to really outline at the outset um, what do we mean by capability development? And that might help us with the, the conversation for the, the remainder of the, the next hour or so. Great. Th thanks, Eamon. Yeah, so I'm going to give the very much the non-technical or high-level um, uh, answer and sort of leave the other experts on the panel maybe to go into a little bit more of the technical detail. So I suppose at a very high level, um, the aim of capability development is really to maintain and develop the most operationally effective and cost-efficient mix of capabilities that are required to ensure the Defence Forces can meet all of the roles assigned by government, both now, both the current roles and into the future. So I suppose the first point to note is on capability, uh, first point to note is capability needs, which is effectively the starting point for capability development. They're based on what the government actually wants the Defence Forces to do, so the roles for the Defence Forces. 
and the role for the defence forces are set out in defence policy, which in turn is set in response to our sort of threat assessment, our security environment. So we have that thread coming down. We have our security environment threat assessment. We have our uh, defence policy. We have the roles. And then you have capability needs falling out of that. I suppose the second point to note then is that uh, defence capabilities, they're very expensive generally, and they're also long-term undertakings. So capability development then also is broader than just equipment ac acquisition. It's um, defence capabilities are developed through, I suppose, appropriate investment in a combination of uh, military doctrine, HR policies, infrastructure, uh, uh, organisation, education and training. So I suppose, for example, if a proposal is to acquire a new equipment platform, like we have uh, the CN295, um, we have an airframe arriving today, that's not just about acquiring the actual airframe, it's also about, I suppose, considering at a, at a strategic level all the consequential for infrastructure, for um, doctrine, for uh, personnel, for training. So it's looking, it's looking a, broad, a broad spectrum. So at a very high level, I suppose, capability development then relates to the management of current capability, the um, identification of future capability needs across a combination of each of these areas. Okay. So, Th thanks, Aileen. Just uh, maybe go to you, Ross. Is there anything <coughs> you add just to help us to understand what we mean by capability development, adding on to Aileen's points? Yeah, so uh, I think Aileen has covered it very, very, very succinctly there. So I suppose everyone does capability development in every institution. They mightn't understand it as capability development, but it's, it, for, for us, the definition of, of it is is how we maintain operational success by delivering military effects in response to policy goals and objectives. So what does that mean? How do you translate that down in, in, into, into an organization? Every single facet of the defense forces is required to develop, maintain, uh, integrate, and eventually uh, uh, end of life capabilities across the organization. So uh, I suppose the Commission on Defense Forces has, has given us a great uh, uh, area to, to point us in, the, in, the, in, in that direction as to what it is that we have to develop uh, with regard to the future capabilities. As Aileen rightly said, that part of that is based on threat assessments, part, part of that is based on goals and objectives. And, and all of these decisions are, they have a policy uh, underpinning them. Uh, and then the military take that, uh, take those military or policy decisions and translate them into actual pieces of equipment, capabilities, personnel, systems essentially that will uh, achieve effects that are required of government. So what, what are the kind of effects that we're required to, to deliver? There, obviously, everyone knows there's national defence. We, we support on Garda Shikana in aid to civil power operations. We support uh, local authorities, the health service executive under aid to civil authority operations with, with regard to the pandemic. And there are uh, requests come in for, for uh, defence forces to support all of these uh, outputs. They're not necessarily primary tasks for the defence forces. So we have to have a range of flexible capabilities that we can employ in both standard conventional military type operations, but also in dual, dual use uh, functions as well. And that's, that's, I suppose, a key point. And uh, as Aileen Whitey said, the, the, uh, the example of the, of the CASA 295, you know, you could look at that, and I suppose traditionally we have looked at capability development as let's buy an airplane, and how much does one airplane cost, or how much do, do, do two or three cost? And that's, that's, the, that's the net investment. No, it's not. It's far more than that. So we have to look at the CASA 295, and uh, what, what is it replacing, first of all? So is it, is it something that's... Uh, is it going to do more than the previous airframe did or, or less or, or something different or something new? Will it need a bigger crew? Will it need bigger hangars? Will it need more time to train our personnel? What is the maintenance cost of that? And then what is the end of life cost? Like I said, will, will we realize something, the value of that asset at the end of its life or will we have to scrap it? And I think it was mentioned earlier today about the impact of green defense and that, that's a factor that is part of the new Commission on the Defense Force as well. And, and the defence organisation strategy. So it's the whole of life from the cradle to the grave of a capability that we have to look at, and it's really important. Okay, no, th thanks for that, Ross and Aileen, which I think sets the, the context really for our discussion uh, today. So I think we'll, we'll centre on two broad areas, really. What are the capabilities we need to develop and why, and also how we can develop these, these capabilities. But, but I, I think one of the other features of capability development is that the process itself of capability development is also critical. So, so building on this, Rory, what is your perspective of the strategic approach that Ireland should apply to the process of capability development, and why is the process itself important? Thank you, and, and uh, good morning, everybody. 
Um, first of all, just to say that I think from a nation-state perspective of our, of our little republic, the Irish Republic, and from the Defence Forces as embodying that in, in, in the sense of Ogleek and Heron, I think the discussion on capability development, in a sense, should be, dare I say it, agnostic or indifferent to issues of neutrality or, or alliances or whatever the case might be. Because we need capability development to have it inculcated within the defence organisation and by the defence organisation, I mean not only the defence forces but the Department of Defence to have a kind of a symbiotic relationship there in developing capability uh, development. So for me the discussion is beyond, dare I say it, the political or even the ideolo ideological concept of issues in, in relation to alliances or neutrality. And I'm also well aware here from both media discussions and in discussions that have taken place in the forum the last number of days that, that the issue of neutrality has been stated by numerous uh, government ministers, including the Taoiseach and the Taunashta, uh, that abrogating our neutrality is, is not on the table. And as Rasa has said, the core of defence plan planning is capability planning. Because when we deploy the men and women of Ogleek Naharan in often very fraught and dangerous situations overseas, be it in a Chadian, a Liberian, or a Malian uh, construct in Africa, where it's inherently dangerous. There's no point in deploying our troops there, uh, wishing that we had developed a capability that we now realise or need, or felt the need that we, that we had to have in, in theatre. And again, it's also very important to understand that our, our troops all down through uh, the various generations in the very proud tradition of Irish involvement in peacekeeping operations have been involved in the cutting edge of not only peacekeeping, but peace enforcement operations, where effectively they had to use hard, hard power. The other thing I think that's important about how to develop capability development uh, within uh, the Irish state and the defence organisation is that, generally speaking, small states in the modern world, if indeed it ever was the case, cannot do it, do it alone. And that also capability development, I think, and this is my, own, uh, my, my view on it, it's not just about military equipment. It's much more complex and subtle than that. For example, if we're getting radar that will give us uh, kind of a visual uh, look at what's taking place off our west coast, uh, you can't have a capability without training the people in situational awareness and analysing in, in, in what, what they're saying. So it's not all about just weapons and hardware and armoured personnel carriers and that type of stuff. It's about greater inter interoperability, it's about joint training, it's about exercises, it's, it's about simulation. And we, when we look at the plethora of issues that's involved in capability and development, it's about the mobility of our defence forces when they're in that Chadian uh, construct where they've been fired on by, by a militia, that they have the equipment, the training and the analysis to deal, deal with what, what they're dealing with. And what capability development is, is essentially it's a conceptual tool. It allows you to horizon scan and look forward, look out to the, to the future. And the missing piece for the Irish state, I would argue, at the moment, is a national security and defence strategy that will exactly do that horizon scanning and look forward out to arguably the next 10 or, or 15 years. That's a threat-based analysis of what are the current threats, the current crocodiles that are metaphorically nearest the boat, about our vulnerabilities, what are our vulnerabilities, why are we vulnerable, and how can they be mitigated, and also having a broad capability-based approach that can deal with a multitude and a plethora of threats, the so-called wicked threats that are out there nowadays. Uh, in a whole spectrum of issues, including cli climate change and all the rest of it. And capability de development, it's a planning process. For it to work, it needs essentially to be an all-of-government approach. Uh, again, as I've emphasised before, talking about the defence organisation working in synergy together. That will assess the environment out there. What are the threats? What are the uh, uh, vulnerabilities? And interpret policy as laid down in a democracy by the government of the day, by the democratically government of the day, to use conceptual tools such as mission analysis and gap analysis to see where are the gaps and the vulnerabilities in what we do, why we do it, how we do it, and how best we're equipped to do it. Uh, th uh, thanks for that, Rory. And maybe, Connor, it would be useful just to get a, a 
a European perspective on this. So what's the approach across Europe to capability development and what are the lessons that we can learn from that approach? Thanks, Simon. I, I think it's good to start maybe with, um, we're, we're going to be talking about short term, medium term and long term, and it's good to, to put a time horizon around that. So by and large, um, short term, you're talking about zero to six years. It will be the norm in terms of EU and also a NATO approach to capability development planning. Midterm, you're talking six to 12 or 15 years, depending on which approach you take. And long term, you're looking at 15 years plus. Uh, and that very much informs uh, capability development. And by and large, with capability development, when you're talking about short term, you're talking about procurement. Uh, that, that isn't the, the bones of, of capability development. At that stage, you've already identified what, you, what you're looking for. You've looked at the different options, and, and you're buying off the shelf to a certain extent, or, or developing. Um, so therefore, the focus is on medium and, and long term, uh, very much aligned with, 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 with what the panel has said already. Uh, capability development is, is looking beyond just personnel or the platforms. Um, at times, we can, we can focus on the platforms towards all the other elements that need to come together to be able to, to deliver that effect, to be able to, to, to board that, that vessel 200 miles off the coast in terms of training people, communications, interoperability, and everything else there and obviously not on effect for, for, for Army and for AIR as well. Um, the, the EU Capability Development Plan uh, incorporates this short, medium, and long-term approach, and it has a very specific methodology that, uh, that's different from, from national process, but it incorporates a lot of the considerations, uh, such as threat-based analysis that Rory has talked about, scenario-based planning, to be able to identify the uh, requirements. So from a short-term perspective, um, the input there comes from the EU military staff, and the focus there specifically is on common security and defence policy uh, operations and shortfalls in terms of platforms, ships, APCs, aircraft, and, and personnel. And that identifies the critical shortfalls from a common security and defence policy point of view for crisis uh, response operations, uh, which feeds into the process. But that's very much short term orientated. Uh, also, you have uh, feedback from, from uh, operations and missions and lessons learned from operations and missions. That isn't just CSDP focused. That also incorporates lessons learned from Ukraine will be feeding into the process as it stands for the derivation of the 2023 EU capability priorities. Uh, and again, lessons that are applicable to, to, to Europe because the separation there in terms of there could be uh, lessons that are identified that don't necessarily apply. Uh, medium term, you're looking at opportunities for cooperation. So uh, where uh, member states have identified capabilities that they're looking to develop, you're looking at out to 15 years whether you can maybe uh, support uh, two or more countries coming together to cooperate together. And obviously there's a trade-off there, but there's significant ben benefits towards cooperation, in particular to, to, to smaller nations. And then the, the, the long-term um, input uh, comes from emerging and disruptive technologies, which is a key element all the time in terms of where where quantum computing, where artificial intelligence uh, will, will, will be going, where the technical, technological trends are going uh, in terms of, of, of developing those capabilities. So all the time you're looking towards medium to long term. And when you bring those four elements together, um, the 2018 EU capability priorities identifies 11 areas over all the, 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 the traditional domains, land, sea, and air, and also the, the new domains, cyber and space as well. Um, and what it does is it provides a full capability landscape to inform EU decision makers, but also decision makers at a national level. Uh, th thanks for that, Connor, which gives us a good overview of what's, what's happening across Europe in terms of that process. And I, I might just turn to, to Aileen. Just, there, there are obviously a lot of discussion about it's a long-term endeavour across multiple time horizons. So how, do we, how does it fit in with our own wider planning uh, processes and, and that link between... Uh, policy level ambition and then funding. Okay, thanks. Um, and I suppose just building on what Connor talked spoke about in terms of the short term, the medium term, and the, lo the long term. I mean, we already do at the moment have a number of structures in defence that support um, investment in defence. They work reasonably well. But they're sort of our focus on the short term that you talked about. They're sort of bottom up processes, and they tend to focus on, I suppose, replacement and enhancement of existing capability. What we're missing and what the Commission called out we're missing is that sort of more strategic approach, this longer term capability development planning process. So we are in the process of setting that up and I suppose the, the strategic intent of that is that we would have this 12 year planning, planning cycle where, uh, and the two outputs then would be first we would have a capability development planning programme 
12 year program looking out over short medium and longer term what are our capability needs over that ter that you know long horizon falling out of that then the plan is to have a sort of a capability development plan four years what are our priorities for the next four years so that's the sort of medium term piece so we're talking about moving from this bottom up to this sort of top down structure the strategic looking out so how does that fit in then with the question how does that fit in with our other um, sort of uh, ability development really uh, flowing from what the government wants the defence forces to do, which flows from defence policy. So we have our white paper on defence. The white paper on defence um, set out the intention to put in a new fixed cycle of defence reviews. So every three years we do a, a review. We obviously did the first one, that was the white paper update uh, 2019. In 2021, we were supposed to do the second strategic defence review. We put a pause on that because of um, the commission, the commission work. The government wanted to see what the commission came up with and, and consider that report. That's been done. So now we're embarking on a new strategic defence review. So um, the strategic defence review, the first stage of that is doing a security assess environment assessment. That's underway. When that's done, then the next stage will be to consider the implications arising from that. Look at the policy requirements. Then look at sort of um, uh, the capabilities, the roles for defence forces, and the capabilities coming out of that. So I suppose where I'm getting to is saying that the current strategic defence review and indeed future strategic defence reviews, which are on a three-year cycle, they will effectively facilitate, I suppose, constant alignment between capability development and um, defence strategy and policy and what, what uh, uh, politicians want to do, what the government wants us to do. And I suppose the strategic defence reviews will inform capability uh, horizons across the very, will inform capability development across the various time horizons. And just to pick up on the very last point then, in relation to then linking policy and um, funding um, and capability development. I suppose the National Development Plan obviously has, has a role there to play that uh, we'll have our defence policy, we also have our National de um, Development uh, Plan, and then we have the link in there in terms of getting funding that we need. OK, thanks, thanks for that, Aileen. And I, what I might move on to, uh, and I might turn to you, Ross, on this, is, is what capabilities do we need to develop and why, and how we can link that strategic process that has just been discussed to the actual delivery of defence capabilities. So within that Irish context and the earlier threats that we would have heard about in, in earlier sessions, uh, what are the, your views in terms of what key capabilities we need to develop in both the short term and in the medium and long term to, to, to make that happen? Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, just to build on Aileen's point first, I suppose. So R Rory mentioned the horizon scanning piece there. So. It's, a, it's our, own, our own assessments. It's what are other people doing? What are other assessments going on? So we've heard about the European Union's strategic compass. What's it saying about the, the future, future security environment? What will come out of the NATO summit later on this summer in, in, in Vilnius? Uh, what, what will be the political direction and, and military guidance taken there? And then we heard this morning about the UN, UN uh, future agenda, you know, agenda for the future of peace. You know, and that, that will give us guidance as well. As what, what are the type of operations that... Uh, that uh, government will sign Ireland up for and that our personnel will have to deploy on. So it's that horizon scanning piece. And then I think you asked me to look at level of ambition too, maybe in a way. Yeah. So I suppose uh, one of the benefits of this kind of conversation is that we're now starting to use a, a kind of a common language and there's an understanding around that. So the very fact that we're using language like a level of ambition is really positive, I would say. And uh, we, we hear it in, in, in the media, we hear it in government circles and certainly been, been spoken about in defence circles as well. But it, what it does is it provides a clear link between if we say we're going to have a level of ambition for, for Ireland and for that the Defence Force will provide, if it's level of ambition too, well that has certain policy uh, enablers that are required and policy decisions. That falls into the capabilities that are needed to, to match those policy decisions and then as Aileen rightly said then the associated funding. And it, it's a kind of a I suppose what we've had in the past, and, and Aidy mentioned the white paper, is we've had some kind of gaps between the level of ambition set out in the white paper and, and the actual funding, and, and the Commission has, has called that out in a way. The Commission on Defence Forces called that out. So what are the areas that the Defence Forces, we now know, so for example, across the main, the main services or the domains, if you want, so for the Army, uh, it's, it's called for uh, increased uh, mobility, increased force protection, and, and increased firepower. So that, that would translate into capability platforms such as uh, a new uh, series of level four armor uh, armor personnel carriers for the future because we know we're going to work in more non-permissive permissive environments on overseas missions but also to provide that realistic 
national defence capability. Our firepower, so we, we, we've seen the increased use of firepower, particular artillery and air defence in, in, the, in the war in Ukraine, and force protection is always going to be a challenge, and R Rory mentioned that in his own intervention there. You know, we send our soldiers, uh, sailors and aircrew, women and men, on overseas uh, missions to, even if they're on UN missions, they're not necessarily, uh, uh, they're harsh, you know, difficult environments to operate in, and we have to provide the force protection that's suitable and, and uh, up-to-date for those personnel. The Navy then uh, is quite clear that uh, we're talking about having a, a more balanced fleet. So uh, we, we, people will have seen the arrival of the new uh, inshore patrol vessels. We're also looking at uh, developing a new uh, multi-role vessel to replace the previous flagship, the Eliasna. Uh, but it also called out the, the fact that we have, we have limitations in our ability to monitor above the surface, which is okay at the moment, below the surface is not so good. And we've all seen the impact of that and some of the questions about you know, the infrastructure, both uh, communications, but also the Nord Stream issue, you know, so we have interconnectors between ourselves and Britain with gas and, and electricity. They're things that we should be able to monitor and, and provide for that whole of, of uh, national defence. And then finally, in, in, the, in the air domain, I suppose, uh, we have uh, a range of new uh, platforms that are coming in, uh, but it, it's called out the need for uh, um, uh, new maritime patrol aircraft, medium lift helicopters to, of the future, but I suppose the one that uh, has been discussed in, in a lot the last couple of days is the issue of the primary radar. So wh what is it that, uh, that the military need to have to integrate with the existing civilian infrastructure? And of course, uh, the previous discussion just before this was talking about uh, the, the, the hybrid, hybrid area, but also cyber, and there's a, there's a high level of ambition set out in the Commission for, for cyber, so we're talking about uh, expanding the size of that force considerably, working closely with partners in, in the National Cyber Security Centre, uh, Department of Communications, uh, and Garda Siakona. But the defence, we have to provide specific capabilities to defend our own networks and to be able to expand out and, and provide other roles. And, and that's, there's a high level of ambition there as well. So a broad range of areas that we have to start addressing in the short term. Sure. A very, a very extensive uh, list of capabilities developed. And, and I suppose what I'm interested in, and I look to you, Connor, just briefly is what are the specific capabilities being focused on in Europe and does that, that align with what, what Ross was talking about there? So I'll, I'll caveat the answer with, um, with Ross had spoken about the strategic compass that obviously the defence landscape from a European point of view has shifted hugely in the last two years. We have the strategic compass, we have the war in, in Ukraine and that has had an impact and arising from that, that triggered a revision of the EU capability development plan and the, the EU capability development priorities that process is ongoing at the moment with the uh, new priorities due for endorsement in, in November this year. So what I'm talking about here is the old 2018 priorities. But we can see alignment still. Uh, things don't change. But you can see continuity, obviously, you know, for the work that's been going on over the last number of years and development of capabilities that, that, uh, that, uh, that yeah, enable militaries to be able to respond uh, to current threats. So Ross has spoken about mobility and agility and obviously ground combat capabilities are very much to the fore. They were to the fore in 2018. They will be to the fore again in, in 2023 with the lessons there and coming out of Ukraine and, uh, and the effect of, of anti-tank weapons against uh, Russian armour and, and whether that's applicable from an EU point of view in terms of EU armour. At an individual level, Alien had spoken about uh, climate change. And at an individual uh, level, in terms of soldiers uh, operating in, in, um, in Africa or elsewhere, uh, climate change, we need to look at, uh, at the effect that that's going to have on, on new materials and, uh, and that's at an individual soldier equipment uh, level. So that's still very much in focus. And Navy-wise, from a broad perspective, uh, from a platform pr perspective, we're looking at platforms for 30 years. So therefore, next generation, it isn't all about next generation platforms, it's also the opportunity to be able to up upgrade the existing platforms with, with new subsystems be able to, to enable them to operate in the, in the now and to the future. Uh, obviously, development of next generation ships is there as well in terms of energy efficiency, advanced communication systems, advanced combat and early warning systems. And a key element here across land, sea and air is, and it's come up in previous panels too, around, uh, around um, unmanned systems, autonomous systems, and, uh, and how to integrate them into existing legacy platforms that are in service. And that's a real challenge, but also a real opportunity as well, specifically from a Navy point of view, where uh, we're well aware of the recruitment issues um, for, for Navy. But, but this is an, a challenge that most navies are facing. So therefore, you're looking at the integration of autonomous systems to be able to counteract maybe the shortages of personnel, 
and there are challenges there and this is very much a focus in terms of how you can exploit those opportunities with, uh, with unmanned maritime systems. And then from, from a seabed, uh, from, a, from an underwater point of view, where the focus before was always very much on a siloed um, underwater domain approach in terms of mine warfare and also anti-submarine warfare, uh, pre-Nord Stream, um, the, 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 I suppose the proliferation of, of underwater capabilities means that uh, seabed warfare has been very much in focus and, uh, and there is a need for, for work there. I'll be using a lot of the capabilities that are already under development from an ASW and from a, from a mine warfare point of view in terms of this move towards uh, robotic systems and autonomous systems to take the, the man and the ship out of the, the minefield or the danger area and that's still very much in, in, in focus too. But, um, but moving away from that, the, the, the new capabilities around uh, cyber it very much is in focus, obviously enough, and the, the need to develop uh, cyber capabilities, the real strategic enabler, C4 Eister, persistent uh, C4 Eister, to have full situational awareness of what's, the, what's, been, uh, uh, what, 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 what's happening on the battlefield. Space is in as, a, as an area, domain as well, which needs to be in focus. And, um, and also, obviously, lessons coming out of, of Ukraine, but also uh, closely aligned with cyber is the, the need to, to, to protect and defend the electromagnetic spectrum uh, of operations. And that's where your new domains are, are coming to the fore there, too. But again, I copy that to say that this is based on the 2018 priorities with the new priorities uh, due in, in November. So uh, an even more extensive list adding to the, the points that, that Rasa would have raised. But one, one point that you, you did re reference was the, the impact of climate. And what I might turn to you, Rory, is just what's your view on the impact of climate change uh, on the capabilities Ireland may need to develop? Uh, absolutely. And climate change going forward will be inherently linked in with the whole I issue of capability development for a plethora of reasons. And climate change is with us. All the panel here will, will agree that's an existential uh, threat to Ireland and humanity, the whole issues of climate change, warming oceans and all that goes with us. I can't speak for the audience of, of their views on that ex ex existential threat. Uh, but it's there. And it's increasingly for militaries in Europe and globally, it's going to be an issue, the whole issue of climate change, to deal with and how, how they deal with it. The other side of that coin is that militaries not only are impacted by climate change, but unfortunately, in some, some instances, contribute to climate change. And I know in that regard that a lot of work has been done in the Defence Forces in reducing their carbon footprint, footprint within the Defence Forces. Now, it's the old story. There's a, a, a lot done in that area, but, but a lot more, more to do. If we also take the discussion and the argument into our peacekeeping operations, whether that be peacekeeping under Chapter 6 or peace enforcement under Chapter 7, a lot of the deployments and the footprints that Oglig Naharan will be doing both now and in the past and into the fu future will be predicated on issues around climate change. For example, if you look at the Sahal region, where we've had troops in Chad and more recently in Mali, a lot of that conflict has been driven by climate change and resource depletion brought about by, by climate change. And equally, the unfolding tragedy that we only saw the other week in, uh, off the coast of Greece of some 600 migrants being killed. A lot of that uh, migration is being brought about by cli climate change and, re and resource scarcity. So for, the mo for modern militaries in the 21st century, this, this whole idea of the disaster security paradigm is going to have to come in to, to, to national security and defense planning and ergo logically into the issue of capability development as well and how, how, how it impinges on it. It's interesting, I think, if you look at the Irish Defence Forces, Old League Naharan, in the last number of years, that actually a lot of their deployments in respect of aid to the civil power and, and aid to the civil authority have actually revolved around this issue of dealing with crises that are predicated on climate, cli climate change. We would have seen the floods in Athlone as a micro case study, for example. But we've also, for example, saw the Joint COVID Task Force under Operation Fortitude that was brought in to deal with uh, the, the COVID uh, crisis that took place as well. And what the Defence Forces, and here I'm going to make a positive comment and then maybe make a slightly negative comment, what the Defence Forces have, have proven that they're very good at is adapting. And their adaptability in stepping up for Operation Fortitude, the Joint COVID Task Force, 
was kind of a very good paradigm of how that can be done quickly on an ad hoc basis because of the expertise that Defence Forces has in command and control, planning, logistics, etc., etc. But the flip side of the coin, and that is that any defence force or military can get, then become a glorified civil defence structure, which we're not, which we're not, and, we sh and in my view, uh, we shouldn't be, be. If you then take the argument forward, what are the challenges for us as a nation state in relation to our foreign policy as to how we deploy our defence forces, not only abroad but at home? What are the challenges for, for, for the defence forces? One of the a series of interlinked challenges that I see for the modern defence forces, particularly on foot of a lot of the restructuring and downsizing that has taken place over the years, is that we have a relatively small professional army, but by internationally benchmark standards, we have a large overseas peacekeeping operation footprint. And supplying that, we have a small professional base of soldiers to do it. Equally linked into that is we have a small reserve defence for, uh, force of reservists. Our military is primarily composed of full-time professionals. And the reserve defence forces, which could have been used as a backup, the RDF, the reserve defence forces, or FCA in, in old money when I was a young lad, no longer have the critical mass to assist in, in these kind of evolving operations if they're to take place. We also have a relatively small air corps, and a relatively small naval service by European standards. And that's even if you look at small other nation states. Dr. Brendan O'Flynn, who spoke on Maritime last week in Cork, has looked at, the, at this, that we have a re relatively small air corps and naval footprint. We also have a defence forces that is predicated, in my view, quite heavily on infantry-based units. And core specialists, particularly in the engineering field and the communications and information services, uh, the cyber services and dealing with the cyberset, that tail, that logistic tail and that specialist trail is quite short. It's quite short to help in any evolving humanitarian or climate-based climate type crisis. We have brilliant people there, but it's relatively short. Again, compared comparatively when you look, look, look at uh, other small, small nation states. What we have shown, again, going back to the positivity, is that we've, the Defence Forces have shown itself to be an amazingly flexible organisation uh, from a joint perspective in dealing with crises as they've evolved and developed. But certainly going forward, when you look at conflict and or humanitar humanitarian disasters that are brought about by climate change, we're going to have to need a more formalised construct and approach to it. And that is again where cap development is absolutely inherent to that planning process. It's going back to the whole, dare I say it, the Rumsfeldian concept of the known knowns and the unknown unknowns. And finally, I would just say, if you look at Germany, it's a very interesting one, if you look at Germany in 2021, uh, really serious floods with a lot of people killed. The German army, the Bundeswehr, which traditionally is kept off the streets in Germany for very valid historical reasons, stepped forward. And the public in Germany welcomed that. And going forward, if the Defence Forces is not adequately prepared in this sphere, the public don't just expect it, they demand us to step forward. So it has to be resourced and it has to be analysed from a capability development process. Oh, no, that, uh, th thanks for that, Rory. And I'm anxious to, to uh, get some questions from the audience uh, very, very uh, shortly. So I'll ask these, the answers to these last questions to be very brief. And we've got a lot of excellent questions on Slido, particularly uh, Rory started to talk about the Reserve Defence Force and so on. So, I, I'm just going to turn to you, Ross, very, very briefly, if you can. Just We've identified all the, the capabilities, the big, long list of capabilities that we need to develop. So what are the challenges that we have to overcome and opportunities that we have to exploit to develop these capabilities, both over the short, medium, and long term? Okay. So uh, time is, is the big enemy here for us in, in this regard. So uh, we, we've got a, a big step up to get to well away too, uh, and, and that's a challenge. So uh, Aileen mentioned about prioritisation. We'll have to prioritise what are, what are the things that we can bring about in, in, a, in a, an expedient manner, but what are the ones, the, the most pressing threats that we're going to face. So I suppose the ones I, I would be focusing in on, and, and uh, from my perspective, would be the cyber domain, our intelligence services, to, to expand that role as well. Uh, we've heard a lot about hybrid, and um, that, that 
as a whole of government response, but for sure the defence forces should be involved in some way in that, uh, and, and that can take the form of very many guises, uh, from simple things like uh, our engineer de decontamination in the event of a biological attack, uh, to, to uh, our information uh, CIS services in that regard, to look at what are, what are the threats on, on social media platforms and around uh, uh, big elections and referenda. You know, so th there are areas that th that. The, the defence forces need to look at, and I suppose the other one then is, uh, what, what is our future posture overseas going to be, and, and what, what is needed there? So, uh, if, if we know we're going to pivot to, to more, um, uh, like for example, we're, we're involved in the EU battle group in, in 2025 uh, with, with our German partners, uh, that's going to place a, a significant immediate demand on the army uh, element of the defence forces, and that's, that's an area we're going to have to, to address. So, the, the, to get proper, I mentioned force protection earlier, soldier systems, body armour, helmets. That are up to up to modern standards. So they're, they're some of the key uh, enablers that are needed from a capability development point of view. So the one thing I haven't mentioned is that all of these capabilities must make us more interoperable, not only across the three services of the of the defence forces, the army, the navy, naval service, the navy of the future, and the air force, but also with our partners, not only on, on island but in our operations overseas. We don't, we don't deploy uh, as a discrete package overseas by and large in our big missions. So in Unifil. We're, we're in a unit uh, with, combined with, with Polish, Hungarian, uh, Maltese, uh, 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 and other nationalities there. That means that the equipment we deploy in order for the unit commander in that base in, in South Lebanon, that he's able to be assured that the equipment that Ireland has is interoperable with our NATO partners, if you want, uh, Poland, who are there on a UN mission. But that, that's the level we have to get to, so that we, interoperability is the key goal that we have to focus on all of the capabilities we, we bring in in the future that they can operate across all of our three services, but also with international partners. Okay, and Connor is, and, and very, very briefly, Connor, because I want to turn immediately into the question, just what approaches in terms of developing these capabilities are being applied across across Europe? If you so take the, one example. The options there, obviously enough, are to uh, bilateral cooperation, uh, PESCO projects are available too, uh, around development of capabilities, but also importantly the development of, uh, of those concepts that underline the, the capabilities that, uh, that Ireland can benefit in, in engagement. And, uh, and for each one of the capabilities that's been spoken about today in terms of uh, level of ambition too, uh, there are projects either at a, either at a system or sub subsystem level around one of those lines of development, be it the, the platform element or be it the interoperability element uh, or, or, or training that, uh, that Ireland can, can look to and see at least through engaging through these forums and projects, at least see uh, what other nations are doing, other approaches that nations are, are taking, and if they wish to, to cooperate with those nations, there's an option there, but also there's valuable learning even to take away and, and to incorporate into your own uh, national planning from a project management point of view in terms of how you're going to approach those those capabilities. Okay, and maybe just to conclude, Aileen, so we, we've talked quite a lot about the process, the capabilities we need to develop, and how we go about it. So what, what is the, the overriding benefit do you see in terms of this new, moving to this new capability development process that we've discussed? Yeah, and um, there's, probably, there's probably a few benefits. Um, I think it will bring us into line with international comparators where sort of capability development is led on that top um, that top-down basis by civil military people generally situated in ministries of defence. It will embed a joint perspective into capability development. It will do what Ross has said in terms of sort of and making sure we remain interoperable. Uh, it will allow for continuous um, and uh, sort of capability needs assessment, which I think is really important. But I think above all, what it will give us, it will give us that sort of corporate level or effective um, investment strategy for defence looking forward, looking long term, and that's what, that's what we'll gain out of it. Okay, no, thanks for that. So I'm going to turn to the floor. Um, to we'll take three questions from the floor. Then I'm going to take a number of questions uh, from Slido, which you can see on the screen, and, and I'll also look, look down the, the, the slide here. So we have one here. Uh, we have one here, and I'm seeing is there anybody on the back? And I think there's one towards the back there as well. And can I just before you ask the question? Uh, just to give your name and to try and keep us succinct because I'm conscious of, of time. Thank you. Okay, uh, Chris, can you hear me? Uh, Chris Reynolds, uh, last couple of years I've been in Somalia leading the EU, EU mission and uh, suppressing piracy and fighting against Al Shabaab. Um, so that mission about capacity development, which I think is very interesting here now. So a lot of speakers and a lot of forums have said Ireland needs to look at niche 
capability development rather than trying to develop a whole defense forces akin to the Danish or Dutch defense forces. So is that the concept? Are we looking at capability develop development along niche lines or across the whole uh, defense forces of being a fully armed uh, 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 defense forces, Army, Navy, Air Force? Um, that's that's the, the first question. Because uh, if it is niche, then we need partners to fill in the gaps. And what are we looking at? Are we looking at the UN? Are we looking at NATO? Are we looking at the EU to fill those gaps? If we're doing a niche, who fills the inter interdependency bit there? And, and the second very quick question is, um, does the amount of secondary roles the Defence Forces have to do and prepare for? Uh, I'm retired Coast Guard, so does the amount of secondary roles detract from the military focus of the Defence Force? So, for example, is the Navy now effectively a military Coast Guard because of its secondary roles and not a Navy because of its primary roles? Okay, thank, thank you. you. And there was another question here, and then there is one towards the back, I think. Um, Colonel Mike of uh, Ruri Omaruku, uh, Sinn Féin TD for County Loud and spokesperson on EU affairs. Uh, look, I don't think anyone's going to have any major difficulty in the sense, obviously, it makes sense to have capacity and capability development, and obviously, threat analysis makes um, absolute uh, sense. And, right, you've all talked about the particular capacity gaps we have. I think that's an acceptance in relation to the fact that we haven't looked after the defence forces and that we haven't resourced them to the degree that's necessary. Look, enough has been said in relation to... Um, the deal or no deal with the RAF and all the rest of it. So uh, I, I think first and foremost, we'll have to look at our own capacity. Look, we know, right, you've already mentioned it, like when radar, air, sea, across the board. Obviously, cyber and, and hybrid, you know, I imagine any threat analysis is going to look at that in a major sense. But it has to be a holistic approach because we were talking earlier about disinformation. Um, we were talking uh, about uh, the fact, of, I suppose we have to talk about the lacks of the, because uh, I see Richard Brown over there. Uh, we spoke before in relation to obviously Pegasus and Predator, and that's the like of that personalized um, malware that literally decides to attack your phone so information can be used against you and all the rest of it. So that's, that's what we, we need to make sure that we're looking at all of that. It also means a wider conversation with the social media companies. And um, that means European legislation, some of it's happening. That also means domestic legislation. And that's making sure that we plug all the gaps. And we have the real info. And we have, because we're talking about, uh, well, we're talking about particular sort of state and non state actors. You know what I mean? But they're making use of what the tech sector has put in play, whether we're talking about the Facebook algorithm or, or whatever else. So we need to make sure that we remove that capacity from them as much as possible while maintaining, obviously, everyone's right to communicate and get you know those messages that should be out there, out there. So I, I think we need to be really clear. But then also, because sometimes uh, I, I think I would have a fear when we talk about cyber and hybrid, and even when the government talks about it, it's almost the Trojan horse in relation to how that journey is made in relation to our move away from non-alignment uh, and military neutrality. And, and like I, I suppose uh, Rory spoke about the huge uh, footprint that we have in relation to peacekeeping. I think we all accept the necessity of making sure we have the resources and uh, that we have interoperability. Uh, we know the cost of it. I suppose Sean Rooney and the loss of private Sean Rooney uh, put that message in clearly to us uh, of the dangers that are there. But if we're talking about peacekeeping operations or if we're talking about observation, observation, uh, observation operations, I'm led to believe that... Uh, Irish soldiers, Irish officials are seen in a particular light on the basis of our history of, um, well, we've suffered under imperialism, uh, we've suffered under invasion and colonialism, so we have that level of empathy. But beyond that, we also are seen as non-aligned and a fair player. And I imagine there's many people when they're dealing, whether like there was talk of Iraq earlier, and it's not only in dealing with the Sunnis and the Shia, but you're also dealing with wider, wider players who come from further afield. And I imagine that's an advantage. So that's what I, that's what I would also uh, put to the panel. Thank you. Thank you. And there was a question at the back. Yeah. Thank you. 
Hi, um, my name is Sinead McMahon. I studied government and political science at UCC. My question to the panellists is, is there a relationship between capability development and the issues surrounding the internal culture and organisation of the Defence Forces? Um, as you know, the Women of Honour report recently found that, at best, uh, the Defence Forces barely tolerates women and, at worst, uh, abuses women in its ranks. Um, my question is, is it, is it really possible to separate these issues of capability development and the internal culture of the organisation? And do you think that capability development and an expanding role for the Defence Forces requires increasing levels of trust in the organisation through implementing the recommendations of the Women of Honour report and improving pay and conditions for serving members? Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we, we've three questions. Uh, one uh, was in the area of niche capability and the impact of secondary roles. To I, I'd kind of describe more in the whole area of uh, cyber and hybrid and what we're doing there. And then the third, third has just got to do more, got to do with the, uh, the relationship between culture and the cap dev uh, unit. So I'll just maybe go to the panel to maybe give some comments on, on that. Uh, Aileen, yeah? I, I, I'm happy to start just in relation to um, uh, Chris's questions then in relation to sort of niche capability and is that where we're going? I suppose our current policy on defence is what's set out in the white paper at the moment and what's set out in the white paper update. And I mean, what that states at the moment is that in broad terms, the government have decided that the defence forces will continue to retain a range of flexible conventional military capabilities. So that's the current policy as we stand um, in terms of we, we retain that broad range of military capabilities. That's not to say that that won't change. Um, obviously, this, this form is very useful. As I mentioned earlier, we have our strategic defence review ongoing. In actual fact, a lot of the, um, the conversations here and the, the um, submissions that were made to the forum will feed into that strategic defence review. So, but I'm just saying at the moment that is the current policy that we do retain the sort of wide uh, range of military capabilities. So um, that's the first question. In terms of the, the, the second part of it, in terms of do, do secondary roles detract from, I suppose, the um, overall military roles? Again, what I would say is that the white paper um, has um, recognised that sort of uh, providing aid to the civil authority is a key role for the Defence Forces in terms of providing a national resilience in times of emergency. So that is there as a key role. Obviously, um, it's not there, though, as the main role. Um, it's there very much as um, a secondary role in terms of we have, I think, about 50 memorandums of understanding and SLAs with various organisations, state agencies, where we provide aid to the civil authority. Now, the reality that, that they're on the basis mostly that they're on an as available basis. So in theory, the military roles come first. We, we do know in reality sometimes some of those asks come in with an urgency and importance that they have to be done, so they do end up being prioritised. But what I would say then is, um, going back to the, um, the the primary role of military, I think the commission called out that you know military and um, the military role is primary. But where possible, we should be developing dual use capabilities and we should be using our contingency you know, to help aid the civil authority. We should be doing that because the threat level to Ireland is low. We, investment in defence is expensive, it's long term, and we have these assets that we should be using in an aid to civil authority role. Okay. Rory, do you want to add anything there? Is no, no, just to come back with, with uh, the gentleman there, Cara Kay, will too, uh, on, on your question and the, the very, various points uh, th that you made. Is, uh, I've actually written a paper on the supposed unique Irish contribution based on our national heritage peacekeeping operations. And just take what I'm about to say now with a, with a, a pinch of salt, with a bag of salt, because it's already been uh, rejected by three separate publishers. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but I'll get there. But you raise a very interesting question that actually locks into capability de development as well, and it's the issue of, of the Irish bringing a unique perspective to peacekeeping with, with emotional intelligence, and because of the fact that we ourselves haven't got an imperial baggage. If you talk to most peacekeeping practitioners from the Irish Defence Forces over the years, over the entire spectrum of operations that we've been involved in, there's a commonality that comes out there in, in, in the discussion, the really interesting point that, that you've raised. And that's be it from the Congo in the 60s, to Cyprus, to Unifil in the 70s and 80s, Mali, Chad, etc., etc. And one of them is particularly in an African, in a sub-Saharan African construct, all the practitioners, many of whom have spent multiple trips out there, 
will say to you that being Irish didn't really matter because of the native population, you were simply another Westerner with a gun. Okay? So, so this issue of that we bring a unique perspective to it is arguably, arguably some, somewhat overplayed. Where it did come in from a capability perspective, I think, is that if you look at the early days of our mission in Lebanon, the UNIFIL mission, right? Because, and this, this is an opinion that I'm opinionating here, because of we were in often extraordinarily dodgy situations, dare I say it, with factions and state actors that were much better equipped and armed than, than we were, including militias, be it Hezbollah, Amal, whatever the case might be, we did have to use emotion and intelligence to get ourselves out of dodgy situations on a lot of occasions. And by the way, it did not often work. We lost people on a regular basis, including trips that I served overseas on. So therefore, capability development comes in that our troops are properly equipped overseas, that in the hard, cold face of reality, that if they're attacked, they can adequately defend themselves. The other interesting thing, and again, I apologize, I meant to bring a particular quote today. It was from the Irish in Liberia. And this goes back to, to capability development. I'll finish on this. It, was, it wasn't from a Western NGO. It was from an African NGO. And they said that when the Irish arrived in a metaphorical village or town or townland or a larger area in joint position, they were respected by the local people and the local spoilers, the local militants and the local armed groups that were trying to cause havoc because they were well-armed, well-equipped and professional. And that's what capability development is about. For a Ross and Vianney, and those three questions, any comments yeah. before we move on to the questions on Slido? So uh, I suppose the, the third question, uh, and thank, thank you for asking, for asking that. So uh, you asked about the relationship between the cu culture and capability development, in essence, uh, in light of the, the uh, independent review group's report uh, on the defence forces. So are they separate? The, the short answer is no, they're not, not at all. There, there is an awful lot of overlap in that. So the Commission on the Defence Forces highlighted a number of chapters on HR, uh, and in that there, was, there were culture, cultural impacts or implications. Uh, so if I, if I answer your question specifically, and, and it, it's a... It's um, very well put. So when we talk about capability development, we talk about areas, three specific areas, I suppose. We talk about um, our leadership, and there's a, there's a leadership implication here, training, training and education, and personnel. And if I focus on those three ones, so, so the, uh, both the Commission and the RG call out that, you know, so some of our HR practices are, 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 are not at the right standard. So we're bringing, what's the answer to that? We're bringing in a new civilian head of HR to, to, uh, to lead that change to... to uh, there's a huge amount of, of a, a change required in that space, so uh, that person will drive that. On, on the gender side of, of things, gender and diversity, we're going to have a new uh, head of gender and diversity at a senior uh, officer level uh, appointed. Uh, we're also going to have um, a, a new promote, look, review or promotion competitions. And then if I focus on the training and, and education piece, we, we, uh, we didn't wait for the, for the IRG report to be published internally in the Defence Forces. We, we set up our own organization culture standing committee to look at these issues so we, we, we designed our own bespoke uh, training package uh, which comes under the banner of, banner of sexual ethics and respectful relationships and every individual in the defense forces when we get the, when we get the trainers in place will go through that course we piloted that in, in a number of our of our units across the organization so we've, we've taken ownership of this uh, we're, we're cognizant of, of uh, delivering best in practice uh, training to our personnel and we'll also roll out unconscious bias training as well. So the two are linked. Uh, it, it's a, uh, ultimately, we're trying to rebuild trust, and you mentioned the word trust uh, among our personnel. That's a key part, personnel. The, the most important element of capability, you can't overstate it, is personnel. And if we don't get that right, well, then we can't start. OK, thank, thank you. I'm going to turn to some of the questions that we have on, on Slido and ask for the panel's uh, views on it. There's two questions there by Neil Richardson and Mark Clinton, which has, I think, got to do more with the role of the Reserve Defence Forces and capability. So I might ask the, the panel to talk about that. Also, there is um, a, a focus on cyber attacks and the intercooperation between various agencies. So the panel's perspective on that. And then the, the, the top question from Stephen Kiernan in terms of in the 21st century, the role of a small country and how we can defend ourselves. 
without the, the kind of cooperation or engagement with, with other partner countries, how, how that one went. So I'll just turn to the panel to, to take any one of those in, in whichever order. Do you want to take reserve, maybe, Rasa, first? Okay, yeah. I'm avoiding the, uh, the packed one. That's good. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, look, excellent questions. Um, uh, I think it was alluded to earlier. Um, you know, we, we have um, significantly... Uh, reduced reserve capacity in the organisation as it is. We're supposed to have an establishment of over 4,000. Uh, we're, we're in around uh, 1,500 and, and below that as well. Uh, so that, that's a significant capability gap for, for uh, defence forces. So a number of years ago, uh, uh, what, what um, the policy decision was to, to kind of reduce the size of the defence force, of the reserve defence force, and to, to align it with the, the permanent uh, units across the organisation. So it's all the kind of the closing down of dedicated uh, reserve units across the organisation and, and putting them in under what, what we call the single force concept, so where they were uh, brought in as elements of permanent units. And, and we took away some of the command structure that was there for the, for the reserve in the past. And, and that led to a, look, we, we have to be honest, it has led to a lack of focus on the reserve that, that would, had been previously there. So uh, to answer the question, what are we doing to address that? Well, uh, a new head of, uh, of the Office of Reserve Affairs has been appointed at the, at the previous rank level that it was before. That will be staffed with both uh, uh, across all the, the, the two services that currently have a reserve, so that's the Army and the Navy, uh, and also uh, there will be a huge focus on, on developing, redeveloping the reserve as, a, as an integral force because it, we have to look at it as, an, as a capability enabler. We've, we've heard about what are the threats that we face and what can the reserve bring to mitigate those threats. So. There's a huge range, so uh, can't overemphasize cyber. Medical is a huge area where we, we can bring in personnel from the medical field who want to have a role in, in, in the, in the uh, permanent defense forces. Logistics, I think we've heard that uh, on, on the other panels I've heard as well. We've heard about how industry and the, and, uh, the private sector is leaps ahead of the, the, the scale of change that the military organizations in general can, can, can uh, bring, bring to bear. So we have to leverage uh, changes in, in the logistics structures and how we can deploy our personnel, how we can support government initiatives at home so we can bring in logistics experts. There's a whole range of, of those areas that we can bring about but we must integrate uh, the reserve personnel uh, into the organisation and that will involve some other higher level, higher level legislative change. Rory mentioned about the ability to give, uh, have meaningful, meaningful deployments for reserve personnel. So we've seen a, a very good positive step there where uh, we, we are enabling personnel, reserve personnel to deploy overseas. That's a positive. We need to see some, some, some personnel actually deploying in that, in that role on, a, on longer missions. But it also needs employment law change as well to support real uh, future reserve force. And these are, these are uh, challenges that the Commission has called out. There are recommendations there to look at and, and there are policy implications there as well and, and uh, they, they will be prioritised. Aileen, I might turn to you to the question of the the, the issue of cyber attacks, particularly... In the, you just re I actually can't see it. Oh, right. The, it's, it, what is the level of cooperation between the Defence Forces, Gardaí and National Cyber Security Centre at a sufficient level, given given the risk that's posed by cyber attacks to Ireland? So it's your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think uh, to answer the question in short, I think there is... Um, a high level of engagement between um, um, the, the players involved. Um, we know that the National Cyber Security Centre, and I don't know how many of you were at the, the session the other day, went through, went through a lot of this, but the National Cyber Security Centre obviously leads the sort of national response to cyber. Cyber, as you know, is more than just even that. It's a sort of whole of society response, in my view, is needed for cyber. Um, but the Defence Forces, um, the, the focus for the Defence Forces then would be to sort of develop a, a joint cyber uh, defence command to primarily defend its own system, but also then act as support to the sort of national resilience effort as well. Um, I think the levels of engagement are there at the moment. I'm personally on, and with members of the Defence Forces, on a, 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 a steering committee who um, look after the um, national cyber security strategy, reviewing that and uh, feeding into that. So, and then at an operational level, there is quite good um, cooperation at the moment. Um, I mean, the, the Commission report itself called out that um, I suppose any enhanced capabilities for the defence forces have to be developed in conjunction with the national cyber security policy, with the guards, with um, NSAC. So, so that is all there, that's in place. I think that's where, where, where we're going to. Um, from a defence point of view, um, I think Ross mentioned earlier on, the capability that we're trying to get to is an additional 100 uh, specialists within the, the uh, Cyber Defence Command, man managing cyber defence, but plus your own IT services and plus your CIS services. 
So um, definitely a lot of cooperation there at the moment. Um, I think everyone is clear on their roles and probably is further work to do in that area. Okay, R Rory, I might turn to you for the, the, the top question there from Stephen in terms of the role of a, a small country in the 21st century. Can we adequately defend ourselves without being part of the Common Defence Pact? But also just, I suppose, more generally, and I think it speaks to the point raised earlier about niche capabilities and how one fits the gaps if you're focusing on niche capabilities. So maybe your reflections on that question. Yeah, I, I think we can adequately uh, defend ourselves with, 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 if we build ourselves from a capability development process that we can do so within means and contingencies to, to a degree. I think, again, philosophically, I'm not diverting from the question, that there's a great quote from T.K. Whitaker when he was down in the Curra in 1972. He was, founding father of the first Celtic Tiger in, 19, in the 1960s, along with Lamas. And Whitaker said that in relation to defence and defending ourselves, he talked about that Ireland Incorporated is like an uninsured driver in a, in a, in a car with no licence and no tax, and is also hoping not to be stopped by Angarda Siakana. And then Whitaker went on to say that we have taken a gamble on peace, and we've taken the gamble on peace because it allowed us to put more resources, be it into housing, health, wherever the case might be. And that debate is still with us to this day. Defence is, is extraordinarily expensive, no matter what way you, you, you approach it. But it's, it's, it's a nettle that you have to, have to grasp. Allied to that, we don't have to be in a mutual defence pact or an alliance. We can work and be interoperable with other European partners in dealing with particular threats, which Ross has already talked about in relation to uh, cyber, etc., etc. Cetera, et cetera. And again, in the modern world, uh, Charles de Gaulle, when he, when he visited um, Eamon de Valera in Ars Nuthron back in 65, I think it was, he said the reason that we escaped the Second World War was because we were an island behind an island. But in the globalised world today, you know, we're exposed. We're extraordinarily exposed from all the plethora of issues that, that have been brought out here today. So we're never going to be a world military superpower. We don't want to be, OK? And, we, and in my view, we shouldn't be. But we can build up our defence and our national resilience to a level that an adversary, whether it be a nation state or a terrorist organisation or hackers operating out of a basement flat in, in London or Moscow, or whatever the case, case might be, can look at Ireland and say, not this time. That's my answer. It's long-winded, but that's my answer. Uh, th thank you for that, Rory. And I'm also just going to focus on two questions that are on Slido, which I think are interrelated, which are from Eric Brennan and uh, Alex. So Eric Brennan asked, what capabilities are Defence Forces looking to develop that will foster retention within the organisation, especially with technical roles? And Alex's question was, the government and defence forces are keen to talk about future capability development. What about capability retention? As it stands, the DF, the defence forces, is extremely limited current cap military capabilities, never mind potential future capabilities. So I, I, I see them quite, quite interrelated in terms of retaining the capability or building on the capability one has rather than just always focusing on the fu future. So I put that to the panel. Who was well, Rasa, suppose, yeah. As the person in uniform, I suppose I have to start off on that. Uh, look, I, I, one, of, one of the key points uh, we, we would always advocate for was, uh, you know, which to prioritise recruitment or retention. You always have to prioritise retention because that's where you've put your, your biggest investment in your personnel into and you must try and retain them. And people stay or leave for a variety of reasons. Uh, people stay because they feel valued, because they feel engaged in an organisation and because they feel that the, the role that they're fulfilling is, is the role that has been given to them. And people leave for, for a variety of reasons as well, in some ways where, the, where those uh, um, uh, values or uh, feelings aren't met or, or where people have made economic or, or geographic reasons. But I suppose the question is specifically about retention of technical personnel. I suppose what we've tried to focus on in our, in our latest um, advertisement campaign is we've got the, the slogan is be more with the defence forces and that's all around the education the development that you get as not only as an individual but uh, as a professional uh, in, the, in the military organisation and also that you have a chance to start 
from a very base level, if you, you can join the Defence Forces without even having a leave insert, and you can leave with a level nine or, or, or a PhD degree if, if that's the path you choose. And that's, the, that's what we aim to give all our personnel. Younger personnel joining the organisation are looking for different, uh, different challenges, looking for different experiences, and looking, uh, looking, looking at their careers in Defence Forces in different time horizons. And we have to adjust our HR uh, and retention strategies around that. But every single capability that we deliver now is technical. The rifle that we use has an optical sight on it. That requires the person maintaining it to be a technical person, but also the person using it to have a level of competence and technical, technical ability to adjust their, their, their simple thing like the sight on your, on your rifle. So all of our capabilities involve uh, some level of technology. All of our people, we're, we're, we're saying that we need to be a tech-enabled force of the future to meet the challenges of the future. That means that we, I go back to my point earlier, we have to be interoperable across all of the the capabilities, all the systems we use, all the units we, we run, the demands that are placed on them is to incorporate more and more technologically advanced uh, uh, capabilities. We hope that that's attractive to people, that that gives people a sense that I want to stay in this organisation because I can see the direction that government is going with regard to level of ambition too, and in a number of years' time, I'm going to see this range of new capabilities delivered with new tasks and ro roles and functions for the Defence Forces, and, and that, that's, that's where we have to go. Okay. And Rory, you're anxious to come in here? Yeah, just, just following on from Ross, and Ro Ross, I, I think, it hit not just one nail, but several nails in the head. But the other issue as well in, in this, obviously, paying conditions are very, very important. Most people, when they're in the Defence Forces, they're in it for the passion of it. And they, they, generally speaking, they want to stay and have as long and as fulfilling a career as they can. So th that's an issue, okay? That's an issue associated with cap cap capability development, paying conditions. The other issue, dare I say, is going back to the reserve. And having a reserve that can bring in people from across society. If you, if you, if you even look at, for example, in the cyber domain, we are one of the world's international hubs in electronics, computers, and people working in all those domains uh, that could come in to the Reserve Defence Forces and make an enormous contribution because they are literally subject ma matter experts in that sphere. The other really interesting one is, is that Irish society has changed so much in the last 30 years. Is with, and I think this may be a jaded phrase, with, with the advent of the new Irish. I was in Galway a couple of months ago and there was a poster in Polish uh, encouraging people of Polish heritage and descent to join the Reserve Defence Forces. And again, there's a, you could talk about it all day, there's a vast range of skill sets there from the new Irish, particularly linguistic skills that could be used within the Defence for, for, Forces as well. Uh, so I go back to the Reserve. The, we need to look at the Reserve to reconstitute the Reserve and to look really, really imaginatively out to wider society and business, commerce, industry about getting in key people. It can be doctors, engineers, IT specialists into the reserve that can again contribute to national resilience and defence. Okay, thanks. Aileen, do you want to come in? Um, well, just, just to take, uh, follow up on the point in relation to pay, I suppose, and just to say, I suppose, just to remember that a lot of work has been done already in the area of pay in terms of implementing the Public Service Pay Commission recommendations, the increase of building momentum and the implementation of some of the recommendations arising from the Commission. So that the starting salaries now for uh, people joining Defence Forces are quite favourable compared to sort of other salaries you have a recruit starting on 37,000. So that you can come in as a recruit, you might need, you have to have your leave insert and you can start on 37. So it is very, very favourable in terms of, so there is good starting pay. Added to that then a lot of the issues Ross has said in terms of your education and training, your opportunities, uh, private healthcare coming in. So just that the overall package, I just want to you know, put that balance out there, that the overall package um, is actually um, looking good at the moment, I would say. And it's a very useful um, infographic that is part of your recruitment campaign at the moment that, that would sort of set that out okay. as well. Thank you, thank you for that, uh, Aileen. So I, I think we are just coming up to, to one o'clock in terms of uh, lunchtime is, is here. So there will be, I'm informed that there's lunch provided outside. I'll ask the audience to please come back at uh, 2.25. Uh, that's when the start for, for the, the next part of the, of the day. And just for people to show your appreciation to the panel today. Thank you. <laughs>